welcome to Tech Strong TV. Today is Tuesday, September 13th, and I hope you all are having a wonderful day so far. I'm your host, William Willis, and in today's show, we're going to bring you some fantastic interviews with incredible guests from around the world. So stay tuned. As always, I'll start off with our Tech Strong News Recap, filling you in on the biggest tech headlines that are making waves. Then we're going to go over to Open Source Summit, where Alan sat down with Jeff Borek, Worldwide Program Director of Open Technology and Developer Advocacy at IBM to talk about the two-way nature of open source and the idea of open source as a community. Also at Open Source Summit, Alan talked with Jamie Thomas, General Manager of System Strategy and Development at IBM Systems, about the creation of the Open Source Security Foundation, or OSSF. Then, Mitch sits down with CloudBee's Developer Advocate, Darren Pope, as Darren shares insights and advice for software and DevOps practitioners attended DevOps World 2022. We're then joined by our very own Cody J. Brown, who will hop on to tell us more about some of the upcoming webinars that we have in store for you. Then we go back to Mitch as he speaks with Luca Disoja, CEO at Villiantis, where they discuss how his agile adoption practice has expanded beyond IT software teams into other parts of their organization. Mitch will then sit down with Sosivio, CEO, Nuri Golan, as Nuri talks about how to address the ever-growing complexity of issues and how a new novel methodology called data swirling is yielding actionable Kubernetes recommendations, insights, observability, and answers. We will then air episode 31 of DevOps Unbound. In this episode, Alan Schimmel and Mitch Ashley are joined by Brian Dawson of RippleX, Hope Lynch of CloudBees, and Adam Kalsey of Tricentis to debate what's right, what's wrong, and what requires best practices when implementing feature flags, microservices, and more. We then finish the broadcast with two episodes of View with Vizard. In the first, Mike interviews Mark Sassone, managing partner for Pinpoint Search Group, as Mark explains why your next cybersecurity job is likely to be for a vendor. In the second episode, Mike interviews Cody Cornell, Chief Strategy Officer for Swimlane, as Cody explains what makes incident management in modern IT environments so challenging. And that's what we have coming up for you on this episode of TechStrong TV. So without further ado, let's get the show started. Enjoy. DevOps.com is the number one online destination for DevOps education and community building. DevOps.com covers all aspects of DevOps, including DevOps best practices and tools, DevOps culture, DevSecOps, business impact, continuous testing, continuous delivery, and more. DevOps.com has the largest collection of original DevOps content, featuring breaking news, blog posts, podcasts, and more. Visit www.devops.com to learn more. DevOps.com, where the world meets DevOps. Hi again, everyone. Here are the headlines for September 13th. First up, the Biden administration plans to increase the restrictions on U.S. semiconductor shipments to China the next month. The Commerce Department plans to publish a new set of regulations which will set harsh limits on exporting semiconductors, as well as the chip-making equipment that is used to produce them. These new regulations would also go to codify the restrictions imposed on NVIDIA to halt shipments of AI computing chips to China. Additionally, the regulations are also most likely to include further actions against China. This plan of action comes as the U.S. government tries to maintain its dominance in the tech industries that it currently does. While there is speculation for what else these regulations might include, we will have to see next month what it entails entirely. Next, Montenegro is currently wrestling with a massive cyber attack that bear the marks of a pro-Russian hacker. A coordinated attack started around August 20th that hampered online government information platforms and put their essential infrastructure at high risk. This attack, which has been called unprecedented in its intensity, has been one of several cyber attacks since Russia invaded Ukraine. Montenegro officials said that a Russian-speaking ransomware group called Cuba Ransomware are responsible. Montenegro was once considered by Russia to be an ally before joining NATO in 2017 and joining Western sanctions against Moscow. As this attack has exceeded 20 days at this point, there's a widespread support by governments that are trying to restore Montenegro's computer systems as quickly as possible. In other news, Google has spun out a high-speed telecom project with the goal of creating a fast, secure, and complex communications network. 
The project was revealed to the public on Monday with the name Illyria. The new project has hit the ground running with Alphabet saying it has transferred almost a decade's worth of tech and IP to it and how it has already secured an $8.7 million government defense contract. This spin out is happening as Google and Alphabet has begun to make decisions on whether to advance or shut down experimental projects. Other projects that have been advanced include Verily and Waymo. Illyria's laser, light laser technology called Tightbeam has been stated that it is improving satellite communications and cell connectivity everywhere. Next, Amazon has stated that they have no plans to make workers return to office. From a recent statement from Amazon CEO Angie Jassy, he announced that Amazon would not force workers to come back. Last October, Amazon announced that it would leave the jurisdiction to individual managers to determine how much time they should spend in an office, and it seems that they are continuing with this approach. This statement contrasts other tech companies such as Google and Apple, which have made statements about requiring employees to adopt hybrid work schedules. Approximately 69% of mid to large sized businesses are requiring employees to come into office for a set number of days, but Amazon's announcement could serve as a marker to the tech and corporate world as an alternative. Next, with a growing demand for short form content, Roku has added a feature to include just that. As part of its new software update, the updated home screen will now include a new section entitled The Buzz. Roku will post short form video clips, trailers, and interviews to engage watchers with several partners such as Showtime, AMC Plus, and Stars. Roku is only the most recent company to integrate short form content as it continues to grow in popularity. Netflix expanded into the short form content space earlier this year with its Fast Laughs feature. Roku has announced that it plans on expanding its short form content offerings in the future. On DevOps.com, we have an article looking at the emerging role of FinOps. As cloud overspending is becoming a more pressing issue for companies, finding ways to oversee cloud financial operations are very important. When properly used, FinOps can act as a culture that can tie together engineering, finance, and business areas for cloud cost management. To learn more, go to DevOps.com. On Security Boulevard, we have an article looking at a survey by Blue Voyant that found that cybersecurity of media companies is at risk. According to the survey, approximately half of all the top media vendors providing content management solutions have potentially compromising vulnerabilities and 60% of the identified vulnerabilities are still unprotected six weeks after the patch has been issued. Media companies face a number of issues that make them more prone to cybersecurity issues, such as how they often rely on third-party vendors for content production. To learn more about cybersecurity in regards to media companies, go to securityboulevard.com. Finally, on Container Journal, we have an article looking at how Vertana added support for containers and Kubernetes clusters to its cloud management and monitoring platform. With these added functionalities, Vertana positions itself within the larger movement towards AI ops that combines machine learning algorithms with real-time monitoring. To learn more about Vertana's recent update, go to Container Journal. And that's today's TechStrong News Recap. ContainerJournal.com is the leading online destination for centralized computing-related content. ContainerJournal.com covers all aspects of software containers, from container management, data management for containers, container security, networking for containers, to the entire container ecosystem, Kubernetes, microservices, serverless, and more. ContainerJournal.com has the largest selection of container-related news, featuring breaking news, blog posts, podcasts, and more. Visit www.containerjournal.com to learn more. This is TechStrong TV. Hey everyone, back here in Austin at Open Source Summit, Linux Foundation. Austin, we have had an amazing day. We spent a lot of time talking about security, though, and open source supply chain security. We're going to talk a little bit more about open source. It is the Open Source Summit. I want to introduce you to Mr. Jeff Borek. Uh, Jeff has been, well, I don't want to say how long you've been with IBM, but Jeff's been with IBM a long time. And uh, the last 10 years or so really focused in on IBM and open source software specifically. And... You know, Jeff will tell you this, but I don't want to embarrass him. 
historically, IBM has been one of the biggest supporters of open source software in the world, right? Going back to the early days of Linux, to many, many other open source, the Eclipse Foundation. Yeah. Great example. Yeah, no, thanks. I, I, when I talk about it, I like to say I stand on the shoulders of giants, right? Yeah. Because back when you know open source was a new thing, the senior leadership team uh, looked into it uh, in great clarity and did some very savvy things. And, uh, you know, the triple crown I like to kind of refer to is, you know, you mentioned Linux, you mentioned uh, Eclipse, but IBM was also fundamental in helping to establish the Apache Foundation. Yes. Wrote some of the bylaws. Absolutely. And so uh, back then, IBM also had a clear understanding that, you know, this was something that IBM needed to be thoughtful about, not just walk in and say, hey, we're from IBM and, you know, we know And I'm here to help. Yeah, or we know what's <laughs> what, right? Do it our way. Um, you know, we uh, tried to go in thoughtfully, both look to how to contribute and establish this new ecosystem, as well as to consume from it in a thoughtful way. Yep. And, and I'm glad you said it that way, because it's a two-way street, and that people don't understand that. I think today more people understand it, but back in the day, people didn't understand the two-way street of open source software right. and of community. Right, right. Right? For too many people, it was like, it has to be a win-lose situation. What's in it for me? Right. But there's, there's almost a little bit of pay it forward in, when it comes to open source and community. What you do right, it kind of does right by you, and it, and it is that two-way street. Well, it's one of the ways that open source has survived as long as it's had, right? Because right. the other thing that I think is interesting is that it all started out with individuals. You know, IBM wasn't there at the very beginning, but you had a variety of people that were passionate about it for, you know, either a possibly a political reason or possibly just an independence reason or some, it's almost like, for some it was almost like a quasi, you know, religious yep. type of thing. No, there, it was. I, but, I was there for those days. You're right. But then, you know, the second wave was when traditional IT vendors, and it wasn't just IBM, there were others that got in involved early on and started to experiment and see what this could, you know, deliver. And the third wave started about, you know, a little over a decade ago now, but it was, you know, it led to what I call the, the wave of the hyperscalers, right? Some people like to say FANG, but, it, you know, the Facebook, Apple, Amazon, Google, all, of all, the, of them. all of the players that built these. So I'll these tell you, Jeff, I, this is how I explain it, and you may agree or disagree. In my mind, that first phase you spoke about... I call the cathedral and bazaar phase, if yep. you remember the book, right? Absolutely. It Great was book. very much, you know, free is in freedom. There were some folks who were into open source because it was free is in freedom. There were other folks who were into it because it was free is in beer. Right. Right. And, and it was that, you know, Dr. Richard Stallman and th that whole thing. The next phase that you described is when commercial software got into it. I call that the big brother phase, where all of a sudden these, these, uh, you know, commercial technology software companies said, wait a second, this is great. We can get other people to contribute to the software we use that we control, that we ultimately own, but we're going to call it open source, right? And we're going to do some good in the community. But at the end of the day, we're going to steer this thing for our own benefit. And if it helps other people, great. But really, we're going to help ourselves a lot. Yeah, I think it'd be, I think... I That's that big brother thing. Well, I wouldn't argue with that, other than to say that different players at scale came at it from different ways. Right, and right? some were more... Um, Focused on what was in it for them. Yeah, that's what I'm trying to Somewhere a little bit more selfish than others. Right. A yeah. At the end of the day, companies are kind of like people, and everyone, I like to say, acts in their own, own self-interest. Self -interest at some point. And some people are very altruistic because that's in their own self-interest. But some people also realize that, that sometimes doing the right thing, comes the wheel of karma pays you back in space. Absolutely. And, and I'd like to think the that... the foundation phase, though. Right, right. Well, uh, and... The foundation phase was always kind of, as big companies got involved, the foundations acted as a counterbalance to maintain a level playing field. Right? Absolutely. Well, I was an Isaac Asimov fan, so I liked the foundation phase. But yeah, it, what it did, it developed this concept of coopetition. Right. Where if we all play together nicely, we will, that rising tide lifts all boats. We start at a really good level, and then what you do with it at IBM versus... 
uh, HP right. is, is up to you guys. Well, uh, another great example of that and this level playing field concept is the whole Kubernetes thing. Yeah. Uh, people, you know, I'm sure Kubernetes came from a lot of origin stories, right? But one of the ones that I think resonates is the fact that back when, in 2014, I was at a conference like this and all the buzz was about Docker and containers and Uber. In Austin, I was too. And, and, and Docker, to their credit, um, they did a pivot. They oh, were working on creating a pass and they were starting to flame out money-wise. And they looked at, well, we've got a pivot. What can we do? Well, we created this innovation around using containers and we're going to contribute that out and then we're going to rebrand ourselves as Docker. And they became the darling of the industry for a period of time. And I was the second chair of the Docker Governance Advisory well, really? Board oh, cool. trying to help them do the right thing. But they made, a, uh, I guess, a calculated step that had pluses and minuses. You have the open source project, and then you have the company that's looking to create products. And they conflated that by branding their project Docker and their company Docker. And that was just one of a number of things that created... Well, there was that. Yes. I mean, there's probably a Harvard Business School review in where Docker, you know, went off. Um, well, but but to, to bring it back to Kubernetes and a, that level playing field yep. concept, so the industry was looking for... How, okay, you know, that's great, Docker. This is innovative, and it shows a lot of promise. It was great. But the, the bigger problem is how do you do orchestration at scale? But they tried to orchestrate. And I'm telling you something. If you or I were in Vegas sitting at the sports book, and you said, okay, here are all of the container orchestration formats. You know, at five to two was Docker, because they had their own orchestration. I, I forget. The Swarm. Name. Swarm. Five to two. Um, uh, 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 Rancher Labs had one they would do. That was a long shot. 30 Meso to Mesos. One. Mesos. D2 IQ or whatever the heck it was. I mean, there was all, there was a whole bunch of them. Yeah. Kubernetes was not the favorite. No. It's hard as hell. Yes. It was so hard. Yes. So, but, but yeah. But, but, but what the part of the way I explain its origin story is that it's 2015 now, and you're a CIO, and I'm here to, you know, from IBM, and I'm mm -hmm. saying, hey, you know, um, you know IBM, you love us, um, and, uh, you know, we have a concept of cloud back in that time that was largely focused on private cloud. Yep. And on the other side of the spectrum, there was AWS starting to emerge, and they were all about public. public. And they wouldn't even, they, they threw shade on anything that wasn't them, as, oh, that's just the traditional vendor cloud washing. Mm -hmm. But Google would go into that same environment and say, hey, we have GPC. We think it's a better mousetrap. You know, at Google, our propellers spin faster than anybody else's. And we based our container orchestration on the Borg. That's what they refer, refer their to internal. Right. Uh, right. So um, we, we saw you're using AWS. Uh, would you like to try GPC? And the answer back was, well, you know, the, the IBM guy was in there just recently, and I told him I'd never use AWS because it's this murky, highly, you know, not quite sure, but it came through the side door. And now I'm using it, and now I have concerns about it because it's like I got my applications in, and I don't know how I'm going to get them out. Yep, so I'm locked. So even though, you know, your GPC story sounds interesting, and I'm sure you're smart guys, I'll take a pass for now. And they heard that time and again. And they started to realize, gosh, we need a more open, friendly on-ramp to our board technology. Hey, you hands, handful of smart Googlers, come up with an enterprise version of this highly complex infrastructure that we can put out there in open source. And they did. And they came back a year later to that same CIO and said, hey, you know, we heard what you said. Look, we've got this new open source you project. Put it on AWS and, or anywhere else. You know, um, so, you know, so let's talk Turkey. And this, they got some takers, but the smart CIO looked him in the eye and said, you know, you're right. It looks interesting. Looks, you know, decent quality, maybe a little complex. And it is open source, but I'll pass. Why? It's a community of one. And what is that? What do you mean? If I 
do the dance with you and something doesn't go right. You're the only people that really understand and it's basically a sole source type of thing. They heard that enough and at that same time, some smart folks from IBM and some others from Red Hat started knocking on Google's door and saying, hey, we see you put this out there. We'd like to contribute and collaborate, but we're not but comfortable not doing it benefit. until it becomes under the control of an independent foundation mm -hmm. so that it's a level playing field and a rising tide can lift all boats. There you heard it, the history of Kubernetes, right? And how Linux Foundation came. I'm sure there are other versions of No, no, I, I'll tell you the truth. I've interviewed Tim Hawken from Google. I don't know if you know Tim. Yeah. He was on the original Google team, Coop team. And um, similar, similar kind of stuff. Yep. But really, that is why the foundational model for open source, I think, has seen us open source rules, right? There are plenty of people today gave us this. 90% of all software has open source in it today. Right. Wouldn't be if not but for foundations. Let's talk a little bit about, though, you're here. Impressions. You know, we, we were lucky enough to speak with Jamie Essay, who's also from IBM, and she is the chair of uh, OSSF. But you had a kind of a and I don't mean to embarrass you again. I'm sorry if we're going out of school here. No, it's But you not had a pivotal role in, in IBM's participation in this. Well, the, uh, yeah, the basically being responsible for IBM's open source clearance process, I started losing sleep four or five years ago because I saw this you know, exponential growth in open source. And again, we touched on it. Open source isn't inherently more or less secure. No. But... Um, because of the sheer volume, it created a large attack surface. And I felt that it was time that we really needed to start like addressing this. And as we mentioned, it's, it's a problem that is you know, pretty um, intimidating, frankly, because it it's, didn't happen overnight. And it's a huge systemic challenge now in the industry. Mm -hmm. And so you come to conferences like this, two or three years ago and you start sharing concerns and that type of discussion between you know, IBM and Microsoft and other players in the industry led to this issue of helping to kind of create the open SSF, what I kind of call 1.0 because it was right as the pandemic was hitting. And so, hey, great idea and there's clearly a need. Can but, we do it remote? <laughs> yeah, and, and and no one has a checkbook that they're willing to open at that right, time. Because we don't know what's going to happen. Because we don't know what's going to happen. Yeah, I remember it. So there's been about 18 plus months of, you know, good intent and the, what I sometimes call the good college try. Yeah. But um, it, it was clear that the problem wasn't going away. Well, so I, I as think, the fall time yeah, frame was coming around again, it was time to basically step up and try and do this right. So... Uh, the business unit that I currently work, uh, work in uh, committed the funds. IBM's joined as a top member. A uh, number of big players have joined. And it's going to be... $30 million a, worth of big players have joined. Yep, yep. And, and certainly it didn't, it didn't hurt that uh, um, the uh, White House issued that... No, that uh, didn't hurt either. Uh, the cybersecurity uh, executive order that went out a little over a year ago now kind of rung the bell with respect to S-bombs and this... Software supply chain security. Right. You know, I've been in security about 25 years. One of the lessons I learned really early on was nothing gets religion to your customers like a good old-fashioned security breach or right. incident. Right. And look, and I'm not blaming anyone, but the solar winds thing certainly, and and then some of the subsequent ones leading all the way up here to Log 4J. Right. Well, you, it, it was not that long ago, but I guess it was long ago. 2014 is an eternity in the tech cycle, right? Yeah. And that was when Heartbleed hit. Yes, you remember and, and that? Boy, the industry dodged a bullet because a white hat found it, and they quietly got a subset Before of the kernel the bad developers. Guys got their hands on. Right. And they came up with a patch, they got it out there, and, you know, thank goodness the industry largely dodged a bullet, and Linux did not get the black eye it could have had. Absolutely. Go forward three years, and it was 2017, and the Apache community had their own, had their own scare with respect to happen. Apache struts. Yeah. 
But to their credit, they found their problem. They got the patch. Just not put, everyone put they, it out there so they, quick. Well, they put it out I there. I mean, not everyone applied it so quick. Exactly. Right. And unfortunately, Equifax. nine, month, nine months after the patch was available. Yeah, I'll go one better. Six months after Equifax, people are still downloading the old version. Yeah. Look, I've been in security a long time. Here's what I, I, I we, we're running out of time, but here's what, let me end it on a good note. I think today we are better positioned, better situated, better financed, better organized yes. to deal with this issue than we ever have been in the past by, by a factor of 10 or 100 or more, right? Yeah. We, I, I think we're on to something. And I think this model... Right, so today it's software supply chain security. Two years from now, it might be another thing we're looking at. But this model works. Yep. Right? Because the, the security problems we need to tackle are too big for any company, whether it's IBM or Google or, or Microsoft or any of them. We need this consortium type of... Yeah, it's definitely... Fixing the software security supply chain is going to be a team sport. Yep. And there's one last thought I'd like to leave your viewers with is that that, you know, we touched on it briefly, but SBOM, Software Bill of Materials, they're on the way, they're going to become an acquire, a requirement, but a lot of what customers are hearing is that they need to publish one. But bef long before they need to put one out, what you really need to do is start learning, get your hands dirty, and then use that learning to address those issues you need to remediate. Internally. Uh, before you start, you know, handing them around like trading cards. I agree with you 100%. We got to pull the plug on this one. We got people waiting, but Jeff, thank you so much, man. I appreciate it. Great conversation. Hey, and many thanks to IBM and all you guys are doing with this. We're going to take a quick break. We've got our friends from JFrog next. Stay tuned. Tech Strong TV. Hey everyone, we're back here live at the Linux Foundation Open Source Summit here in uh, Austin, Texas. And as we mentioned earlier, uh, today is is a day of uh, I don't know if you want to call it daughter sister foundations or satellite conferences. The main event really starts tomorrow. But there's several important foundations who are holding conferences today. One of which, and kind of the one probably nearest to me, is the Open Source Security Foundation, OSSF. And we are really happy to be joined by Janie Thomas, who is the governing chair, or the chair of the governing yes. board of yes. OSSF. Exactly. Got it. Janie, welcome to our show. Thanks for joining us. So... Look, when you're not busy running or got, being chair of the board for OSSF, you have a day job as well. If you want to share with our audience, feel free. Well, first of all, Alan, thanks for having me. Oh, I'm really pleasure. pleased to be here to talk about OpenSSF. But I am uh, a general manager at IBM responsible for systems development and delivery as well as IBM's enterprise security uh, program. Right. And enterprise security, of course, is how I got involved in this particular topic. Absolutely. And, and that... Look, that is a world and job unto itself, and we could probably do a few hours on that, but we're going to focus on, on OSSF today. So, you know, for most of our audience is familiar, we've covered, we've had the pleasure of speaking with Brian from OSSF a few times. Um, it was a nice idea, I think, when it was first conceived about, yes, we need to do something about security, about the security of open source tools specifically. Um, and then kind of all hell broke loose, <laughs> you know? Sometimes, sometimes things just work like that, right? History runs in currents. So we started the open, you know, the OSSF, and then we had this spate of supply chain yes. security issues and the whole S-bomb thing with the White House. And then like kind of the, the cherry on top was Log4j. I guess that was around when, January or? December of December. last year. And that's really, I, I guess, accelerate, has it accelerated? Maybe you had big plans to begin with. <laughs> Talk to us a little bit about kind of the whole OSS, how this whole OSSF, how it all came together and 
What's happened? Well, I, I think it was very fortuitous that the industry did come together last year with the Linux Foundation to create a new governing body around open source security called the Open SSF. Because as you say, not long after that, we had this uh, industry compelling event, Log4J. And realize the industry had already had, we'd already had solar winds the year before, which also ruined our holiday in December. Yes, it did. We had Kaseya, we had a number of these big supply chain attacks. But the difference I would say in Log4J is just the predominance of the asset in code. It had been out there for over 20 years. It was a very utilized, a very popular uh, piece of code. And so it affected uh, a lot of software. Mm -hmm. So one of the things that uh, you realize when this kind of thing happens, it's not just about your fidelity of being able to identify it and get it patched, but for all those downstream consuming organizations, how fast do they roll out these patches? Because we're talking about a huge amount of affected software. So I, I think that there's nothing like a true test of your governing body. <laughs> and uh, this was test actually a real uh, test run of what we needed to do in OpenSSF. And of course, it garnered a lot of attention from the U.S. government and, and, and other entities that we can, we can talk more about. Sure can. So let, let's talk a little bit about the charter or the mission of the OpenSSF. And it's something I brought up to you off camera. Which is, okay, Log4j, let's make that the poster child for a second. So Log4j is basically this open source component, if you will, right, that many, 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 many applications have incorporated into their package, if you will, into their source code. And it's not, look, I'm not blaming the Log4j developers or anything. There was a defect. I don't even want to, you know, it became a vulnerability, but there's a defect. A lot of software has defects that we haven't even mm -hmm. found yet. But nevertheless, this one kind of went public, and then we saw exploits with it and in the wild, and, and you know, such is mm -hmm. the world of security we both live in. Um, what is the chart? Is, is that what OSSF is about to prevent, or de not prevent, but deal with future Log4J kind of events? Well, I think first and foremost, OpenSSF is focused on a proactive posture, right? So how do we prevent uh, these kinds of events? And so to do that, we think there's a number of things we have to do. First and foremost is education, of course, in terms of basic security education for developers. Um, another key tenant is how do you put automation on steroids? Mm -hmm. So the automation and best practices that are reflected in that automation that open source projects can consume. How do you get that out to the most critical projects and then provide some support for the long tail projects, if you will? Sure. It's also about working, frankly, with other industry um, consortia as well as the government. Um, particularly, we've been working with the U.S. government in, in the OpenSSF to define what are some actions that are really going to make a difference. And I think critical to all of this is getting collaboration across the different insights, from the governing body, which includes a lot of technology firms as well as commercial firms, like there's a lot of financial firms actually involved in the governing body. Mm -hmm. um, what are the key elements that we really need to address first? So getting those priorities set and then having an execution agenda and really getting something done in the short term, I think is really going to be important for, for this group. Well, look, a lot of people look out at what you guys have done and you've gotten stuff done, right? There's been a tremendous groundswell of support. And granted, Log4j didn't hurt you in that regard yeah. as much as it hurt others. Uh, but there's been a tremendous groundswell, right? There's been, a, a, you know, I think about $30 million raised, right? Between mm -hmm. some of the biggest names yeah. in tech kicking yeah. in here. Uh, there's been the White House and, and then CISA uh, involvement. So it, it's certainly for a relatively new um, foundation, it has really garnered a lot of, I don't want to say market share, but a lot of publicity, a lot of attention. Yeah. Um, now, of course, the, the question is, okay, how does this translate to rubber meets the road? How do we prevent the next log 4 I don't know if we can prevent the next log 4 j but how do we minimize the right. next log 4 j How do you minimize the impact? Exactly. Because I would say, if you look at what happened with Log4j, the level of preparedness was not there. So, Certainly. you know, how do you get it remediated fast enough? How do you identify it? How do you help 
uh, the open source projects uh, be more effective. In this case, it was, uh, uh, of course, tied to the Apache Foundation. But not only that, how do the commercial entities then take advantage of that patch and act expeditiously to benefit the clients? So I, I think there's a real opportunity here. In the world of cybersecurity, you often learn that no one pays attention to a lot of things unless there's a huge compelling event, and that's what this was. So while it was not desired, it was helpful in that, in, in that vein. So coming out of all of the meetings that we've had, uh, the collaboration that we've had across the industry, it's going to be imperative that we execute and that the things that we have identified as top priorities, that we make uh, measurable progress on those uh, projects this year. Sure. And I think that's the importance of, of this open SSF day, day here today in Austin, which is allowing us with a key set of stakeholders to start to share perspectives of the projects that are underway and how others can engage in those projects and how, once again, working together, we can actually make a difference. Um, I think this, on, this ongoing level of engagement, making sure that we have the right stakeholders engaged, uh, is going to be important to make progress. Absolutely. And, Absolutely. And, and, and as you know, in the world of open source, um, the, the, the nice thing about OpenSSF is we do have the ability to hire critical roles that can focus on this full time because the nature of open source typically is that it's a, it's a volunteer army. Right. Right. And there's thousands and thousands of volunteers out there. But then how do we help with these resources, enable those volunteers to be more effective? And, and frankly, that's been one of, I think, the key ingredients to the Linux Foundation's formula for success is, you know, herding. It's a bit like herding cats, herding the open source community. It's it's vast. So, you know, mm -hmm. cast of thousands, hundreds of thousands, millions. But you need a few full-timers who are, this is yeah. their day job, right? This is, their, this mm -hmm. is what they do. Mm -hmm. Jenny, I want to talk a little bit, the people who are watching this now at home, or maybe, you know, recorded later on, they weren't here. They didn't get what was happening, especially today, which is kind of, you know, the OSSF stay. Um, Give them, if, if you don't mind, a little bit of maybe a, a synopsis of what they're missing. Well, we just got started, of course, so we have a little bit more to go today, of course, in terms of the uh, actual kickoff of Open SSF Day. But I think what I see is real commitment, uh, particularly from the presenters I've seen so far, a commitment that they've all personally made and outside of their day jobs, frankly, to make a difference in security for open source software. And that's really the key here. Um, are we turning the corner on a new level of commitment around security? Right. There's always been a commitment in open source around innovation, around feature function. I mean, that's what's allowed it, you know, that's what's driven open source and allowed it to be so successful. And for others, other corporations like IBM, we've taken enormous advantage out of that, right? We've all gotten a huge advantage in productivity out of that. But now right. it's really about turning the focus a little bit more uh, getting that focus on security so that we can use open source and continue to have that productivity, but with confidence as we go forward. And I really have been, have been impressed with all the speakers today and their personal commitment to this topic. And, uh, and that's really impressive. And I think we'll see that for the rest of the day as well. I'm going to come back to it that to you in one second. I, I want to touch on something else, though. And that, and that is this. Look, I've been in security for 25, going on 30 years. Well, security 25, IT 30 plus years. Um, and I, you know, if I had a nickel for every survey I read that said security is one of the top three priorities of IT or the CIO or an organization, I'd be a rich, rich person right now. But I, like I always said, their arms were too short to reach their pockets oftentimes. Yeah. And it wasn't until something bad happened, like a log4j or you know, some incident, you know, code red. I could go through a whole history of these things that people kind of get religion, right? <coughs> Excuse me. Sometimes it takes that for them to get religion. I don't, I don't know why. I hope, I always hope that it changes, that people finally do start taking it seriously. I think for the OSSF, though, the important thing to remember, especially in our audience, this is a fact we give them all the time, 
today's applications, there's 75%, 80% open source <laughs> components that are kind of stitched together with maybe 20, 25% of, you know, sort of original code, if you will. And so if someone's not watching the store on those open source mm -hmm. components, whether they're artifacts or scripts or whatever, you're, yeah. it's only a matter of time. It's not if, it's when, right? And so that's why I think this is such a vital, such a vital function, this foundation. It's mm -hmm. something needed to happen. Here. Yeah. This is, and this is the perfect, I think, place for it. Anyway, I'll step off the soapbox. You mentioned a couple of the speakers. Anything stand out to you or that you can kind of clue our audience into? Well, I think other than the commitment, uh, there's a keen focus on making it easy for the developers, yeah. right? How do we make it easy for the uh, maintainers of these open source projects? How do we make it easy for the contributors? Because uh, without doing that, it will not have the consumption by developers at large, right? And I know this even inside a corporation, we have the same challenge, really. It's all about codifying the best practices in an automation framework. Um, and, you know, whatever that is for your organization, that's going to be critical. And that's why it's so critical for these open source projects. Um, you know, I, I think that with the right approach, we will make a, a difference. But it also, as you said, requires stakeholders involved to continue to educate their organizations yep. about why is it important. Because all of us actually have the ability to... Uh, increase the number of contributors we have on these projects mm -hmm. to contribute our expertise. Uh, and that's going to be very important, I think, that we as the governing body and other organizations really create a sustaining promise around open source. Mm -hmm. So it's not just what the open SSF is doing itself, but how we enable that to be successful in the long run. Because uh, we're all getting the advantage from open source. And like IBM, we, of course, it's IBM plus our company Red Hat. It has a little bit to do with open source. Mm -hmm. uh, but those kinds of efforts and keeping that keen focus are going to be very, very important as we go forward. No, 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 there's no doubt about it. Be it also goes back to what we said before is, look, there's a new Log4j kind of... of horizon event horizon out there every day yeah, that we, there he is so you're not going to prevent them you've you've got to put in your response you've got to have your protocols in place and this is the kind of stuff where yeah, I absolutely I, I will tell you else. that um you know i have a window into cyber operations which mm -hmm. is uh, my job every day at ibm and we're getting over 100 billion events a day so that gives you kind of the context for what you got to deal with in the landscape and product security, of course, is one of those triggers. If it's not, if you've got malware, if you've got issues, they're going to be one of your events, right? Yep. So it's a little bit of a reflection on our responsibility to enable effective cyber operations for organizations. I mean, we have a huge uh, responsibility, but we have a huge opportunity here. Absolutely. And I, I think I want to make heroes out of developers for really worrying about security. That's kind of one of the goals. You know what? Look, you're preaching to the choir here because, <laughs> you know, I started DevOps.com in 2013, 2014. And I did it because as a security person, I thought it was the best thing to happen yeah. to security. If we yeah. can get developers security aware, security yeah. conscious, half the battle, half the battle. And, you know, for a long time, it was, it was an uphill battle. Let me say this. But this whole notion of what we call DevSecOps mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. making security for developers, it's really gone mainstream, yeah. right? And I, I think part of that is realizing is developers, security is everyone's responsibility. It's a very overused thing. Developers are not security people, but I've never met a developer in my life who says, yeah, I'd like to develop insecure <laughs> software, right? I want to use, I want to use an old uh, version of an open source you know, a uh, component that, that has some known vulnerabilities. None of them want to. We all have pride yeah. in our work. It's just we need to make mm -hmm. it easier mm -hmm. for them yeah. to, to do. And I, I think that's something OSS can, OSSF can yeah. really help with. Anyway, I know you're busy as heck. I want to thank you for coming down and hanging out with us a little bit. To you, Brian, the whole OSSF team, keep up the great work. Well, we're expecting big things. No pressure, <laughs> but we're expecting big things from you guys well, to really make 
make the difference. Well, in thank this. you, Alan. I'm really pleased to be here today and immerse myself in this topic and get to know many of the players that are here today. And thanks, Absolutely. thanks for the opportunity to chat. No problem. <laughs> Just before we leave, real quickly, the OSSF website, I think it's ossf.org. Open, 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 open ssf.org. I got a little help from my off-camera team over there. So go check it out. If I... I, you know, if you're not here in person, I believe it is virtual as well. We'd love to see you as part of it and support the Open SSF. We're going to take a break here in Austin. We'll be back in a bit. CISO Talk. To hear how real-world CISOs are dealing with today's real-world issues. From enabling secure remote workers to accelerating secure cloud adoption, defending against a pandemic of security attacks and beyond, CISO Talk covers the cyber topics you want to learn about. With your hosts, Unisys CISO Matt Newfield and Media Ops CEO Alan Schimmel, featuring a revolving panel of CISO cyber experts, this is where CISOs talk. Join us on digitalanarchist.com and techstrong.tv. This is TechStrong TV. I have the great pleasure of being joined by Darren Pope. Darren is developer advocate with CloudBees. Welcome, Darren. Hey, thanks, Mitch. How are you doing today? Awesome, awesome. Uh, are you in I, Miami? Are, I mean, that feels like Miami. It's uh, Fort Lauderdale, so you're pretty close. It's close enough. Just yeah, you know, it's right. Just it's, right up the right up the the beach there. <laughs> Fort Lauderdale is a much better airport than Miami. We'll leave that there. I agree with that. <laughs> I, I, don't, I prefer not to if I don't have to, but exactly. so you, you've traveled enough, you know, all those, those secrets. <laughs> yeah. And, well, and we probably shouldn't be talking about airports today. What should we be talking well, about? Well, we should be talking about the Orlando airport because that's where <sighs> uh, DevOps world is coming up on it the is. 27th and 28th. And you and I are chatting. That's what our, our topic is. I'd love to get your perspective on DevOps world. Before we do that, tell us a little bit about what your role is as, as developer advocate at CloudBees. So my role at CloudBees as a developer advocate is I'm basically a YouTuber. Shh, don't tell anybody because that's where I spend a lot of my time. And is, you get paid to do that. And I get paid to do it. That's, that's a wonderful thing. And I create a lot of content around Jenkins and CloudBees CI because those have been, our CloudBees CI has been our flagship product for a number of years. And of course it's based on Jenkins and so I, I focus a lot of time there. And if you go back through any time, it's like I've done a lot. Let's just put it that way. If, if you go and look at our, our YouTube channel, you're going to see my face a lot. And you're going to see this background a lot. Uh, but I really enjoy it because with Jenkins and with Cloud BCI, we get to talk about lots of items that people just maybe don't think about. Or maybe they're thinking about, well, do, do I really want to go with Jenkins? Do I want to look at Cloud BCI? That's, you know, hopefully some of those videos will help uh, answer those questions for you. Well, talking about Jenkins kind of takes me back home. That was the first quote unquote DevOps tool that I used starting my journey way back in the, I don't know, 2012, 13, something like that. So yep. it's a great place to start for sure. And with CloudBees. Well, let, let's talk about DevOps world. It's obviously not your first rodeo. You've been to these kind of conferences before. And I'm sure you have a pretty good appreciation for people who are coming in, lots of different people, but the folks that are doing the real work, the pe people that are practitioners doing this day to day, like like you are as a developer advocate working with Jenkins and Cloud BCI. What is it that you know that folks coming to the conference can get from that kind of an experience? Well, a lot of times it isn't just about going to the sessions, even though I want to talk about a couple of sessions today. A lot of it, just like any conference, is going to be the hallway track. Well, what's the hallway track if you don't know what it is? Uh, it's basically when you can't find anything on the session you want to go to, or maybe you've been in enough sessions and you feel like your brain is mush, then going to the hallway track, which basically means who's hanging out in the hallways while sessions are going on mm -hmm. and people or people finding coffee. Those are probably one of the most exciting parts of the conference is because you're going to meet people that you've never met before, obviously, and you just strike up a conversation. Now, I, you probably can't tell it, but I'm an extreme introvert. But when I do one-on-one, -on -one, like what we're doing right now, man, that's that's where I get the most out of it. And sometimes, sorry, some of the speakers, uh, I, I enjoyed it a little bit more than going to your session. 
I'll say it. I bet you're not the only introvert attending. Matter of fact, I'm one also. What, what would be your suggestion? Is if you're, you're walking down the hallway, there's people kind of going going by, or people standing around the water, the coffee machine, whatever. What's a great introduction, to kind of icebreaker to start that conversation? Hey, who's going to Disney World today? In this case, um, but one of the, the more serious ones is like, hey, what do you do at, at where you work? Like, because you, you try to spy out the badge. It's like, okay, who are they? Are they a vendor? Run away quickly! Don't don't talk to the vendors. Um, I'm a vendor, so you can talk to me. Uh, but if you see something like a Fidelity or an Amadeus, and it's like, wait, I saw people from this crew had sessions. It's like, okay, what is it? I, I couldn't make the session, or I'm not going to be able to make the session because I'm going somewhere else. What is it that you do? Right? It's like, here's what I do. It's like, is it, do we have any overlap or not? Yeah. And, yeah. and the other thing I talk to... about themselves, right? What do you do? Exactly. Tell me about you. Yeah. Yeah. Because, and maybe one of the first things I try to get to, sorry, managers, it's like, do you actually do the work or are you a manager of people doing the work? Because if you're a manager, I'll, I, you know, I might fist bump you, but then I'm going to move on pretty quick. Because I want to talk to the people that are in the trenches dealing with the day to day problems. Yeah, people like me, people that are doing the work. Yep. Yeah, they're in that role. Exactly. Well, great. Um, and, and I do appreciate, you know, we, we as technical folks, we like to avoid the sales people and all of that kind of stuff. There is a way you can go talk to the vendor booths and you know, yeah. sort of find what you're looking for or maybe listen into conversations. So there are some good things you can do there, too. But I totally get what you're saying. Go find people like yourself, right? Your people yes. that you can learn from or connect with similar experiences, maybe experiences you don't have that's probably just as valuable maybe more yep and plus then you've got potentially a buddy to hang out with mm. the conference with you know two or three people i've done that at conferences over the decades and it's just sort of like it makes it easier. It's like hey do you want to meet up because like a lot of times in fact this case my wife is traveling with me on this on this leg of the of leg of the show you know i'm only doing one so it doesn't really matter there's only one show uh so i'll be able to hang out with her but honestly she's leaving town to go visit friends so I'd probably be searching around for people mm -hmm. uh, that are not part of my group. And let me, you know, encourage people. It's like, if you're coming with three or four people from your company, okay, maybe hang on a little bit, but try to find some other people to hang out with. Yeah. It feels weird. Amongst yourselves. That's, a, that's you, you already yeah. see those people, right? Find yeah. some new folks. Yeah. Well, let's talk about some of the content um, at this year's DevOps world. By the way, it's on the 27th through the 29th in Orlando. Correct. Um, so, you know, tell us, what are you looking forward to or what would you recommend to folks coming to the conference? You can share your screen and go right ahead. Oh, you got it. You've got have, your plan I have all paper. ready to go. I'm plan, but here, let me go and share my screen. And just in case people have not taken a look at the site, it's going to be at devopsworld.com. And then, of course, the URL goes completely wonky from there just because, you know, whatever. What you'll do is, I have to slide because Zoom. I'm good to agenda. And then once we bring up the agenda, there's tracks. So if you click on tracks, now you'll notice there's a Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. So Monday and Tuesday are paid workshops. Let's skip over those for right now. I'm gonna go to Wednesday. And I'm gonna click on tracks and just select practitioner. There's five total tracks. So if your boss is with you, have him go to somewhere or have him or her go to a different track than you. That's so, but we're gonna focus on practitioner. So this top one that comes up, actually not the top one, but it falls into it. Both of these two here. Supply chain, good grief. Supply chain is everywhere all the time. And there are a handful of sessions. This top one uh, from Adam at AWS Security is a good one. That one's on Wednesday. There's also a one on Thursday. Let me look at the list. That's called Tackling Supply Chain Security by Modernizing Jenkins. And that is done by the people from Fidelity Investments. So one is a vendor, one is people actually doing the work. I'm considering AWS a vendor in this case. If your company is not looking at supply chain, uh, you soon will be. It's that plain and simple. So supply chain to me is one of the cool things. Mm -hmm. uh, and and, and really a table sessions stakes. on that too, right? Yeah, there I, I remember numbers. looking, there were like 20 sessions on supply chain, on <laughs> ethics <laughs> to practical, yeah. you know, using Jenkins. Yep. Another one that I want to call out, let's see, what do I do this? Oh, there's this one from Amadeus. And again, I, I said Amadeus earlier, but if we take a look at, where was it here? What was the name of it? It was called the Dev, the Ops, and Git. Uh, there it is. How fast can they recover a disaster? Now, if you don't know who Amadeus is, uh, Amadeus is a travel platform. You may have heard of Galileo or other ones, Sabre. 
it's in that same space. Very large one. <laughs> Very large one. So, you know, all we want to do is accelerate everything via automation, right? We want our coffee brought to us faster if you're still in the office. Uh, and we throw everything at it we can. This is what triggered it for me. DevOps, GitOps, SecOps, whatever ops, quick, 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 quick ops, you name it, right? So, again, this is another one that is from a person in the trench. So this is one that sort of caught my eye going through. Um, I have to give a hat tip to Jenkins. There's one called Contributing to Open Source Workshop. I have to, right? Mm -hmm. Just because mm -hmm. it, we just have to. Uh, where was it? It was in the morning on Wednesday. Sorry, this is taking so long. I should have ordered these, but I can't order them. So no, you're looking at the real site. So I am looking. And this is what people will see, too, right? Once you filter it, this is what you're going to see. Um, there it is. Contributing to Open Source Workshop. So we have Mark Waite, Bruno. I'm not going to try Bruno's last name. I've never tried it before. I'm not going to try it here for the first time. And Jean-Marc Meeson. Uh, if who's also known as Santa. If you ever see a picture of Jean-Marc, you'll understand what I mean. So this is a 90 minute workshop on teaching people how they can contribute to open source. And Mark and I did a series of videos uh, probably a couple months ago. We we're talking about modernizing Jenkins plugins. And this is similar around that. So a lot of the content for, that was from that series is gone that has has been put into this uh, session. So if you're considering contributing to open source, this will be a good way to look at it if you've never done it before. I have one more for this Wednesday, and then we're going to go to the, Thursday. The keyword there being intimidating, I bet these folks remove those kind of barriers. Like everybody has a first time com contributing to a project, right? Let's yes, show you how absolutely. You absolutely. Okay, here's one. This is the last one on Wednesday I want to call out. DevOps for dApps. Do you know what dApps are? Or DAPs? Say more. Yeah. Okay. So it's decentralized applications, smart contracts, blockchain. I've done some just off the side playing with Solidity and doing some development that way. And I was like, how in the heck would I even you know roll in DevOps as just somebody starting to play with it? This session is going to give me some of those answers mm. because why not, right? Smart contracts. If you look at ignoring all the, you know, the financial woes of some of the blockchain stuff going on, uh, the the true thing of smart contracts is is really key to all this, right? What what is a smart contract, right? Can I prove that this this asset was signed? Maybe it was a, truly a contract, right? And, and following the thing as a blockchain, yeah. Contracts. yeah. Again, this is not one that I would use for day job type stuff, but this is interesting from a hmm. I wonder what this is going to be like. I want to understand it. What's going yeah. on? Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's a good uh, point because you can explore topics that you're like, I'd like to know more about. Even if I don't know, I'm going to use it. But exactly. I want to be informed, right? Because you might get one little piece of information out of that that helps with your day job part of things, right? It may not apply directly, but it's like, oh, wait, I could take that, massage it, and then bring it back. And it's like, oh, now I can do this. And I'll, I'll bet money you go back to your day job within a few months, some manager somewhere in a meeting is going to bring up blockchain, not know what they're talking about. And you can say, well, I do know a little bit about it. And you can sort of get started on the right foot, right? Yeah, for sure. So I want to take a look at a couple on Thursday, if that's okay. You bet. Okay. So for Thursday, there is a session, a roadmap for effectively scaling Feature flag management. Oh, feature flags a big topic. Great. Topic. Feature flags a big topic. CloudBees, in full disclosure, CloudBees does have a feature flag product called CloudBees Feature Management, and Steve is one of the engineers that works on that. And also Todd Barrett from Dynatrace is going to be there. Now, okay, you're thinking, okay, why CloudBees and Dynatrace? Well, this is the other thing we have done. If you click on the session, it expands. Oh, and there's something else I need to call out too. Uh, there is an open feature initiative that has now been launched through, I believe, the CNCF. Somebody correct me if I'm wrong. Oh, wait, nobody's here to correct me this time. And any corrections coming in here. Okay, good. So I believe it's open feature and, or excuse me, CNCF. So seeing how this now standard is being brought out to the world. So this is going to be very interesting to watch. If you're into feature flags at all, if you're considering moving, two feature flags for your business applications or any other use case for it. Uh, this will be one to go watch. Uh, I do want to call out one thing. I think it was, no, it wasn't this one. Let me go back to Wednesday for just a second because I'm not going to click all day long. Oh, there it is. 
Notice sometimes you'll see this ISC CPE submitter. Mm -hmm. So what that means is this session is CPE eligible. So continuing, continuing, I can't remember the P, education. Professional, yeah. Professional education. So if you're needing some check boxes to make, you know, to justify you going to the trip, you can get some CPEs out of these. And why not right. get credit for it? You know, yeah. you're going to be there. Exactly. Even if you don't have to justify it, it's a great thing. You have to have so many CPE credits per year to maintain your, your whatever it is. Certification. Exactly. First um, let's see here. I want to go down to where was the one that I wanted to take a look at? There was one about modernizing code development with dev containers. Now, dev containers have mm -hmm. recently come out from GitHub and Microsoft in general. And if you haven't looked at them just on the side, if you're not using them today, because, you know, again, it's, it's newish, I would recommend going to the session. Dev containers are pretty cool. Again, it's, it's nothing um, earth shattering, if you will, but neither was Docker. Well, initially it wasn't, right? It's, it's a container. If you'd used LXC before, it's like, okay, it's just a container. Who cares? Mm -hmm. But then it went beyond that. So you know, if, you haven't, if you haven't looked into dev containers yet, this is one session I would recommend going to. Um, Some great stuff because, on GitHub too, like if you're using absolutely. VS Code and how to do dev containers or whatever. Exactly. Development environment. Use. Okay. What is your IDE? Oh, I actually, I do use VS Code. I use okay. PyCharm for Python. I use kind okay. of a variety of things. So I use, you know, okay. even, you know. So you don't use just one tool? No, not at all. Okay. So this last one I want to call out here is moving to microservices with Jenkins. Uh, think about it. If I'm trying to piece together microservices, do you think everybody's going to be using the same tools, same languages? Mm -hmm. Right. There's no there's no need to anymore other than standardization within an organization. So to me, and this is for protege, this is another in the trenches person, right? This is not a vendor, if you will. So this is going to be one session that I'm going to try my best. It's around the lunchtime on that Thursday. Uh, but again, you know, this, this is one that looks really cool to me, because if I can simplify microservices and Jenkins together, I'm all in. Mm -hmm. And of course, there's other ways to do it too, right? I'm, you know, there's plenty of other tools, but I want to see how they solved it with this specific constraint of using Jenkins and Terraform and, you know, what, you know, this tool set looks fam very familiar to my tool set. And that's the other thing I'm looking through is I'm going through sessions like they're using the same tools I am. These guys aren't. So which you know, which way am I going to go for a session? Yeah, I'll probably lean towards the, the people using my existing tool set mm -hmm. just because there may be something in there that will make my life easier. So I can go home at five o'clock and not have to think about work the rest of the weekend, if you will. You know, one of the things I, that I noticed about the practitioner track is the, the topics, they're not narrow, but they're focused. In other words, you're not going to get yes. like tons of theory and debates about what, you know, what does cloud native mean or the definition for blah, blah, blah. You're going to get, all right, how do you implement microservices? And how do you go about doing dev containers? What do you, yep. you're going to submit open source for the first, you know, it's, it's very practical. I know I'm a practitioner, but it, what I mean by that is you should walk out of there with some really good tips, tricks, information to go apply if that's something you want to do. That's true. Uh, I believe that was the last session I wanted to share. Is okay. there anything you want to poke at and look at that? You actually, can I call out one, one other thing? No, please do. Okay. It's not about the agenda, but if you're staying on site, which is, again, it's at the, this, I'm trying to find the sessions here, the Orlando World Center Marriott. So if you're staying there, included in the resort fee is a bucket of golf balls and drivers each day mm -hmm. that you're there. Now, look, I don't play golf. Do I look like I play golf? I don't have time to play golf. I don't have time to play golf. <laughs> but but give me a bucket, a bucket of balls. Of balls. I'll go hit that. something, right? That's <laughs> something, right? So that's that's included in the resort fee. So there's other things that are in the resort fee. It's like, okay, you can get shuttles to Disney or to downtown Disney, all those things, right? It's just all the typical stuff because it is near the all the parks, mm -hmm. but primarily the, the Disney parks. So. Well, fantastic. Um, 
Do you ever uh, give folks a way to contact you if they want to like, yeah, I'd like to meet Darren. I saw him on this video or I follow your YouTube channel or. You know what? The best place to find me, two different places, and I'm not very active because I'm always putting out other things, but you can find me on Twitter, Darren Pope, D-A-R-N-P-O-P-E, and also on LinkedIn, same handle. Great. And do you post during the conference kind of, hey, I saw this cool talk about such and so or. Well, I guess I will be now. Thanks, Mitch. <laughs> that was not sorry. I didn't mean to get you committed to something. <laughs> That's fine. No, I, I need to be doing that. Yeah. Don't we all? We have to do a little bit better. I yes. do, certainly. Good. Okay. Well, Darren, it's been fascinating talking with you. Thanks so much. You know, a lot of great information and good tips for folks. You know, really get, you know, there's tons of value there. It's just sort of how do you get to it? How do you get to the things that's going to be most helpful to you? And I think you've. Yeah done that uh, in an excellent way. So thanks for joining us. Uh, go check out devopsworld.com and uh, sign up if you haven't registered already and uh, get your plane ticket or drive down or whatever you're doing and meet up with folks. I'll be there as well. I'll be doing some tech strong TV interviews and going to some sessions. So looking forward to it. Thanks again, Darren. Appreciate you. Thanks, Mitch. Looking for a live conference focused on the tools, technologies, and practices most important to your business? Innotech conferences are live, one-day business and technology conferences highlighting the latest in trends for IT leaders, developers, and IT professionals. Each event combines education, innovation, peer-to-peer -peer networking, and the latest technology and business solutions for a diverse IT-focused audience. Innotech conferences occur throughout the year in strategic regional locations, bringing together technology professionals from various industries to learn about the solutions, practices, and tools impacting their day-to-day -day work and gain insight into what's to come. Presenters at Innotech conferences are selected and curated to ensure each session provides the most up-to-date and relevant information without any hype. Whether your interest in digital transformation, cybersecurity, cloud, IT leadership, or DevOps, Inatech conferences deliver. 2022 events are scheduled to be held in Austin, Dallas, Oklahoma City, Houston, and Washington, D.C. Inatech conferences are produced by TechStrong Live and powered by TechStrong Group. Hey everybody, happy Tuesday. Cody J. Brown here with some upcoming programs from TechStrong Learning. So we are kicking tomorrow off with an early program on DevOps.com. So Wednesday at 9 a.m. Eastern, Plutora presents SRE plus VSM equals a direct line to customer experience. Our panel will discuss how site reliability engineers can use value stream management insights to observe customer behaviors and optimize accordingly. Following Wednesday at 11 a.m. Eastern, Circle CI is bringing you a program titled Better Together, Accelerate End-to-End -end Software Delivery Chain with Best of Breed Tooling. This panel brings together experts from Circle CI, Atlassian, and New Relic who aim to show you how to protect yourself from dynamic challenges during software development and delivery. And finally, AWS and Weaveworks have partnered and put together a hands-on workshop to show you why GitOps is a standardized workflow to deploy, configure, monitor, and update and manage Kubernetes. Join us Thursday at 1 p.m. Eastern for simplifying hybrid cloud Kubernetes with AWS, EKS, and Weaveworks. So that is all I've got for you right now, but as a reminder, we do have plenty of upcoming and on-demand programs for you here at TechStrong Learning, so stay tuned. Coding is changing the world, making a difference in the world. We take anyone, any adult, and help them become the best version of themselves and become a software engineer. At TechStrong Group, we've undertaken to meet this challenge with our Engineering the Change Scholarship. My career has completely changed to now being sought after by some of the biggest tech companies in the world. Full $10,000 scholarship to one winner to attend the intense software development course at Boca Code. I was just ready to be a software engineer. So, Donald is another story. Right now, it's kind of like, mm, I don't know. 
honestly starting to scare me a little bit. Roller coaster of understanding something one moment and then feeling lost the next. If you change the capitalization of a file name, you are going to f your whole project. At the end of it, you're gonna be a really good family. We call Stephanie like the silent ninja. As much as he's struggling, Donald really, really wants this. My house burned down twice. The biggest thing I'm struggling with definitely is time. It's pretty cool that I've been able to expand my mind to be able to accept different ways of doing something. My only option is to succeed. Book a code and we do it! Highs definitely getting started. Lows would be Diary's jokes. <laughs> We told all of them that this is the hardest thing they would have to go through. All of our graduates are, are absolute stars. Welcome! Who will graduate and become a software engineer? This is TechStrong TV. Well, today I have the pleasure of being joined by Luca de Sergent. He is uh, with CEO uh, Villantis. Did I say that right? Am I close, Lucas? <laughs> close enough. Close enough. Thanks okay. very much. Good enough for horseshoes, as they say, as we say. Um, so tell us a little bit of welcome. Tell us a little bit about yourself. Tell us a little bit about uh, what your company does. Um, so I'm, I'm the CEO of Valiantis. I'm uh, based, in, based in London, been living here for 15 years, and my passion is always been around how do we get stuff to work work better, whether it be teams, processes, tools. I just love to see things work better. And that's what we're doing at Valiantis. Our focus is all around um, getting teams to work better uh, through technology, leveraging technology and the best processes, in particular agile methodologies, uh, and enabling other teams to to make the most of um, to make the most of these technologies and, and processes to change how they work. I know that you're passionate about um, agile, and I'm so sure you've worked with a lot of teams um, implementing agile and maybe practicing it yourself. Tell us a little bit about that experience. We've worked with uh, we, you know our journey with agile started a long time ago. Um, we've been a partner of Atlassian for 15 years. And Atlassian has been the standard system that software development teams have been managing their workflows for years and years now. And all the almost all software teams in the world have experimented, adopted, scaled Agile, some point on the Agile journey in the last uh, 10, 15 years. And as such, we've really been at the forefront of this, of seeing this adoption of Agile practices as our customers primarily or initially dev teams have wanted to adopt these, uh, these practices and, and also evolve the tools that support these practices. Um, and, and so we've, that's what we've been doing. Now, beyond dev teams, as we see this DevOps uh, change, we're, we're now doing this with, um, with IT teams doing Agile ITSM um, and beyond. We're getting interest from marketing people, for example, who want to who want to adopt agile as well. Uh, we're moving towards this connected enterprise or enterprise agility, um, and we hear CEOs talk about wanting to become agile. Uh, you wouldn't hear that fifteen years ago. Mm, no, no, it, it's kind of sort of like lean, the lean business, agile business mm -hmm. uh, is is certainly expanded from what we've done within the technical world, software world. It's interesting because Atlassian's products, like Jira specifically, has gone from a ticketing system to a workflow, right? I don't know yes. how they would describe it, but um, much more taking on being competitive with ServiceNow and companies like that. I would imagine that's taking you into some of those other parts of the organization. Is that how you've kind of gotten into working with other parts of businesses? We started with Dev, ticketing system. Um, but if you think about it, if to quote uh, someone else, software is eating the world, and therefore software teams have be are becoming more and more central to a bank. Software is becoming crucial to their product, their go-to-market, their offering. A media company, a telco, software is so central, and software teams want to work 
in uh, following agile methodologies. And therefore, the whole organization is having to adapt to that, to react to this disruption initially, um, um, but positive disruption that the software teams are bringing. And the software teams are, teams are coming with their tools, they're coming with Jira. And it's kind of a, a, you know, a logical step for those teams who see this, this system used um, to support agile ways of working, uh, to enable that, which has this universal quality where you can put any workflow in it. Um, it's, um, it's an easy next step to be porting it over to IT operations, to marketing, to, uh, to give you some example, we have insurance companies who use Jira to manage um, underwriting processes. Um, so you have hundreds of underwriters across the world collecting tons of documents, sending them to people who, who, who will review them. They'll do all that in Jira. Um, or we'll see, um, uh, we'll see marketing teams manage all their, their campaigns, their release calendars, their projects in Jira. At the end of the day, if it's, uh, if it's a process, if it's a workflow, it can be digitized and it can benefit from from agile ways of working, and it can benefit from tools that allow you to scale this, to industrialize this, like Jira. It makes a lot of sense. You know, in agile, you you have cross-functional teams, right? Product folks that are part of it and others. So you're kind of cross-pollinating some of the process and tools and uh, methodology, philosophy of how you work. But also, you know, development isn't just an IT thing. There's a ton of development going on outside of IT and business units and in marketing and in yeah. finance and different organizations. So uh, some of it low code, some of it, you know, you know, C++, uh, just all varieties of it. So it seems really easy or a natural fit that that evolution would happen to start to spread beyond the boundaries mm -hmm. of software teams. Yeah, absolutely. Um and the the other teams love the and really recognize the benefits of agile so it's not just something that they that they see happening and they have to adapt to it because now developers are working in different ways they're releasing much faster the, the pace of change is going faster they're also seeing the benefits of adopting agile the uh, benefits of being able to adapt to constant change so much uh, so much faster. That's the, the for me. The, the key benefit of agile is that it creates that culture of adaptation, that culture of constant change, and it makes it normal. It it sort of trains its organization to be designed for constant change and for constant repositioning. Um, that's something that's very attractive as well. When you're another part of the organization that perhaps is more much more rigid um, structure, it's also something. Uh, that's attractive because it's about empowering teams, empowering teams to make decisions for themselves. Uh, so it drives to more, to happier team, to higher retention. And that's also something that's really attractive for these other parts of the organization. Mm -hmm. Well, it's in, in other parts of the business are being asked to move more quickly and be more adaptive, pivot, things like that, just like software teams are. Yeah. So, and, you, and with COVID, you know, with COVID, mm -hmm. it's it kind of brought that, it's accelerated that trend. You know, when you have hybrid teams distributed globally, um, teamwork has been forced to evolve even more. Uh, it's been stressed a lot, and and so people have looked at how do we how do we maintain that teamwork, that productivity, um, while we have hybrid workers uh, and more and more global teams. Yeah, we did <clears throat> our research team, which I'm part of. Did uh, did some research, and, and that was exactly the question we were asking: Are some of the developer methodologies, things like Agile, Scrum meetings, stand up meetings, things like that, um, are those are those starting to be used, utilized during COVID time by other parts of the organization? It was a very very strong positive that absolutely they that they naturally gravitated to that. Do you do you do most of your work still with development teams, or are you increasingly doing more outside of development? Increasingly more outside, um, I think the and the challenges are different with development teams. It's more, it, it's no longer about how do we adopt agile at the team level. I think that's become, it has become a standard by and large, mm -hmm. but more about how do we adopt 
how do we scale this uh, all the way to the C-suite? Um, and there are different approaches to doing that. But you know, traditionally, you would have what we call project portfolio management, which is very command and control. Um, Agile's kind of challenge that. So at the at the team the team level, you have these new ways of working, but the the part above had not evolved, uh, and so you had this clash where the C suite would have visibility up to a level, and then it's agile, and we're not sure we we're uh, we're struggling to get visibility, we're struggling to know what our costs are. Um, so bringing agile to the enterprise level is the main challenge that um, we're helping companies solve when it comes to dev teams. When it comes to outside of, uh, outside of dev teams, it's more around uh, the maturity is much lower. So it's more around mm -hmm. what is the benefits of Agile and how do we apply this recipe, which has been perfected over many years for dev teams to a marketing organization or an IT operations organization where the, the, the drivers, the constraints, the expectations are so different. Um, but Marketing is a great example where a lot of the marketing work actually mirrors so much of software development projects. It's all about how do we bring products to market? How do we lead cross-functional teams? Um, uh, doing a big marketing campaign is very similar to a sizable software project. We need cross-functional teams. We need testing. We need ideation. Uh, we're going to need to release. Um, there's going to be assets, artifacts, uh, validations. Um, so much of this is similar to to dev. It's interesting as I think about it. In development, we're used to certainly project management methodologies, and you know things like agile and, and DevOps, and have come along and part of our environment, part of our, our culture. A lot of times in in the business units or outside of IT. Maybe project management has been part of what the their work environment is if they're like launching a product or something. There's a lot of a lot of functions who may have a process or workflow, but nothing like agile that's sort of a mm -hmm. methodology that that wraps around it to to help all of that happen. how do you how do you find folks warming up to that idea of like, okay, I understand there's a a process for meetings, but what do you mean there's an agile process for how we're going to do all our work? How did, mm -hmm. was it, do you get kind of skepticism and how do you overcome some of those things? Yes, there can be skepticism. Um, I think the key is to get the right level of executive engagement to any agile transformation. You you need to get leaders on board uh, leading that change and influencing it and even showing, showing the example. But a great example of that would be a legal team. Uh, and legal teams are not always known for being the most, uh, you know, the earliest adopters of uh, new tech. Mm -hmm. um, but there's a lot about agile that you can adapt. You can you can adapt to to legal workflows. Um, we we've implemented Jira and agile methods, for example, to in-house legal teams of large customers where they get all these inbound requests. I need this NDA reviewed. I need this contract reviewed. We have this project here. So there are tasks. There are projects. These projects are going to have to involve a lot of people. Um, and we're going to need transparency across the board. We're going to need visibility across the board. We might need to adapt really quickly. Well, certainly, that doesn't sound so far from, from Agile. Um, and you can bring in your, uh, your, your visual boards. Um, you can bring in your your Scrum teams with uh, you might not call it Scrum. You, you want to give it another name. Maybe that doesn't sound as uh, mm. uh, as uh, <laughs> as techy, perhaps to your to your to your legal team. But they they still really enjoy doing their stand up meetings, reviewing the backlog, um, doing estimates, uh, prioritizing that backlog, um, and going through uh, going through. Uh, rituals. They enjoy the um, how the tool facilitates as well all these interactions, knowing who does what, who's where, and these ones give me a lot of satisfaction because these are usually teams that that have been very poorly served in terms of methods and technologies in the past. Mm -hmm. No one's really been building modern ways of working for lawyers, um, 
Uh, and, and it's great to be able to make quite a big difference and going from sending a Word document with Outlook to collaborating, uh, collaborating in this way. Very good. It's, it's exciting. It's exciting to share what works, whether it's from IT or software dev product projects and others. Um, I know you've got a study, a report that uh, you all put together. I'd like to hear some more about that, and we'll include a link in in the description, the show notes, so folks can. Yeah, do we've um, um, our teams were written a, um, uh, a really good white paper called "Journey to the Connected Enterprise." Um, it talks about the um, so it's really more focused on on those dev teams that are looking to scale agile, that are looking to really get to the um, to the full connected enterprise, having the C-suite aligned with the teams and vice versa and all the levels in between. Um, how do we, how do we, uh, you know, how do we, we mend this disconnect that we tend to see? Um, so we've done a lot of research on that and, uh, and that's a project that, uh, that's something that's very close to, uh, very close to us today. And, um, there's a report that's out on this called Journey to the Connected Enterprise. So it's extremely useful because uh, I think all organizations, I guess, unless you're really small, but go through that transformation, right? Where you may do things on a smaller team by team, you know, dev project basis, but at some point hitting that scale, taking it to the next level and increasing adoption or being successful in adoption. There's some, yeah, that's where the real challenges I think start. Uh, Cause it is organizational change, not just change on a local level. Absolutely. Um, it's, um, you know, agile adoption has been very much a bottom up change. Mm -hmm. uh, the teams have taken it upon themselves, have proven that they deliver more value with this. Um, but it's not usually something that's been guided by the, by the C-suite. Um, now we're having the C-suite interested. They want to adopt this and they want to bring all the way up. Um, it's more of a top down change, more of an organizational change. Um, it's, um, it's harder, um, it's harder because of the scale, uh, and the element of consistency as well that you, you'll seek to, to obtain when you're at a team unit, your consistency is sort of within that team. It's a lot easier to obtain than when you're 500 teams and you want those 500 teams to, to work in unison. Retaining the freedom that Agile gives them, the ability to adapt, but also bringing that sort of overall sense of coordination and visibility. Um, yeah, in in our experience, it I mean, it's the classic trio of people, processes, and tools. You need all three, but you need to start with people, uh, and you need to start with people at the top. Uh, getting the executives on board, getting them to lead the change, uh, to advocate for it. Um, you need to learn the processes, uh, define what yours are going to be. They might deviate slightly from the templates that exist in the market. And then you need the tools to sustain this, to make it work, um, to, to industrialize it. Um, we've seen also transformations that failed because of lacking the right tools. Very good. Well, Lucas, thank you very much. Um, I'll put the link to the report specifically in our description. Uh, where can folks find out more about your company? Um, the link to the report will uh, will take you to uh, to the to our website. Um, we have a blog with uh, with regular posts on the topic of agile transformation. Um, I suggest starting there. Great. Well, thank you. Uh, Lucas, it's been great talking with you. Lucas uh, Desorge with uh, Valiances. We'll talk to you soon. Thanks, Mitch. Mm -hmm. okay. This is TechStrong TV. Of the great pleasure of being joined by Nuri Gowan. Nuri is CEO and co-founder of Socibio. Welcome, Nuri. Hey, how are you today? Good to be Very here, good. Um, even better. We're going to talk about Kubernetes. Great topic. So excited to talk with you. Well, first, introduce yourself. Tell us a little bit about you. Tell us a little bit about Socibio. Sure. So I'm Nuri Golan. I'm the CEO and co-founder of Socivio. We're a predictive troubleshooting platform for Kubernetes. So basically, we're keeping Kubernetes environments and applications uh, that are running on them, uh, running smoothly, 
We automate a lot of the troubleshooting process using a, a, a new approach, which we call data swirling. We can talk a lot about that today, uh, but we're helping DevOps teams you know, optimize their, their workloads and function a lot better. Excellent. Well, well let, let's start out by, I, I think it's, you know, everyone says uh, Kubernetes is a complex environment. Uh, I don't think there's a, too much debate about that or it can get complex fast. What are some of the challenges people have with trying to manage and operate Kubernetes environments at scale? Well, I think that, you know, Kubernetes does a lot of uh, great things. And, and the reason people want to use it is because it, it automates a lot of the normal processes that they have to, to go through when they're running uh, anything in the cloud or on-prem. Uh, but there, you know, with any automation that you use, there's going to be layers of abstraction and, and ultimately, you know, so the expertise that's required to really keep everything working smoothly tends to be harder to come by uh, as you rely more and more on that automation. So, so we're seeing the same thing in Kubernetes as it's become more, to, more of the standard container orchestrator out there. Uh, there's there's a, a difficulty keeping these environments uh, running smoothly, especially as they grow in complexity and size. Uh, there's a ton of information available, a ton of signals, data that you can you can use uh, to to troubleshoot these problems. Uh, but you know, too much data is certainly uh, becoming a problem. Mm -hmm. Well, and like any technology, you learn over time. You you get comfortable with it, get experienced with it. You sort of build up a knowledge base that doesn't necessarily help you when you're scaling very rapidly, deploying more applications under on Kubernetes. Uh, it's not like the technology waits for you to catch up, right? It's it's going to, and the customers and the people that are using your software are going to do what they're going to do. So the, oftentimes that's the challenge is like, how do I get up to speed fast enough? Or why do I deal with all the messages, alerts, logs, information, data that I'm getting uh, from Kubernetes and know what to do with it? So aside from having a better way of pulling it all together, right? We certainly need a way to look at that information. Talk about data swirling and why that's approach why that approach helps well we when we got started with the company we felt that there was really a a gap in in the tools that can be used to automate a lot of the troubleshooting process or just you know speed up the time it takes to, to fix environments or fix applications or anything running in kubernetes when when they do go down um, so data swirling is specifically built because and maybe i can quickly talk about what it is but it's essentially a tightly coupled system using machine learning and data collection, which runs on Kubernetes environments on the edge. So it, it runs inside a customer's environment. Uh, the entire system is built cloud native. It's uh, proprietary to us. So it includes the data collection, the analysis, insights, correlation. All of that is done uh, locally in the customer's environment. And the reason we did that is because there's just, as I was saying earlier, the massive amounts, you know, the velocity, volume, and variety of the data that, that are available um, when you start to offload that information elsewhere, you know, at some point it does become cost prohibitive or security prohibitive, where there's many, many customers in, in a variety of different secure industries that are not comfortable with their information being pulled elsewhere, aside from all the GDPR, you know, the, all the regulations around personal information. Um, so there's a whole sector of, of uh, you know, many industries which don't have tools that are uh, usable today, or at least that the, the barrier and the hurdles to use these tools uh, are extremely high. And so data swirling was a, you know, edge approach to analyzing and deriving insights from the data uh, that can be in completely disconnected and air-gapped environments. And aside from the technology advantage uh, that it's much more resource-friendly, uh, again, we're not taking anything off the environment, so we only keep the bits of information that we need and we do all the analysis on the edge. Uh, but there's also a security advantage in that, again, we're, we're not taking any information elsewhere. And so it, it not only allows us to work in uh, many different types of environments, but also with many different types of customers that have been slightly underserved by the tools that are out there today. I'm curious too. Often, um, CEOs, entrepreneurs start companies because they lived with the problem that they're solving and the kinds of technologies. How did you come across uh, this approach to uh, helping with Kubernetes? So, I have a, a kind of interesting story. So, our, our CTO and co founder, Liran Cohen, he was at uh, Red Hat and he was a principal Kubernetes architect in Europe and Israel. Uh, you know, and he was also a professional service provider. So he was the guy that was called into many of the larger organizations using OpenShift. And, and when Kubernetes 
when they were facing Kubernetes problems, he was the one that would get pulled into the war room to really, you know, help them figure out what was going on. And so he saw firsthand how many of these large organizations specifically were struggling with Kubernetes adoption. Uh, and so it became, you know, a passion project of his to try and automate some of his life and the work that he was doing as a, as a professional service provider. I met him uh, several years ago. In my previous life, I was uh, leading the uh, corporate venture arm for Lear Corporation, which was the company that acquired my, my first startup. Um, and at, at Lear, I had actually been working on some other edge compute applications, specifically with e-commerce platforms in the vehicle. There, there was also a problem with uh, data, the amount of data coming from all the sensors in the car. That became, was becoming cross-prohibitive, and we needed edge compute and edge analysis to kind of figure out uh, what data does need to go back, what analysis can be done on the vehicle itself. So it was a, it was a really nice uh, merge where the same approach and the same kind of problem in a, in a bit of a different industry. Um, and we really connected and decided to uh, start this company and, and push it forward along with uh, two other co-founders who uh, one was a friend of Lee Ron's and one was a, a co-founder of mine from a previous company. Interesting. Uh, interesting crossover to connection between sort of the edge edge analysis compute from the environment you came in and, you know, Kubernetes experience that Laurent had. Well, I think we're seeing it across, you know, many different industries, especially as AI becomes, uh, more, you know, the, it's a very buzzword, but as technology is adopted by more and more, uh, you know, legacy industries, there is a lot of common uh, overlap between the tools or at least the approaches that are being used by these companies. So uh, it, it wasn't a big leap to go from automotive to uh, enterprise cloud software because the fundamentals are, are pretty much the same. And you had to operate at scale, right? <laughs> Both do. Yep. Very interesting. So uh, talk a little bit about where in people's adoption curve of Kubernetes do they first encounter this problem? Are they you sort of overwhelmed in the beginning because there's a lot of new things to learn and your best to kind of set this up from the start? Do you have to get to a point where you've got enough data here where you can really take advantage of you know what a technology like yours can do for them? Yeah, there's you know we we look at it as like day zero, day one, day two problems. Uh, we started building it as more of a day two approach. You know, somebody a company has already uh, moved their workloads into Kubernetes and they're looking for help in managing those environments better. But we've also realized over time that uh, day zero uh, ahead of the adoption or as they're migrating to Kubernetes, there's a lot of advantage to using a tool like ours uh, because they get set up to work the right way from the beginning. And there's also a, a, a big uh, fear barrier for many of these companies who are, who are scared to adopt Kubernetes because of the challenges that are well known. Um, so having a tool that, that alleviates some of that concern, knowing they won't run into many of the troubleshooting issues after the fact, uh, has helped some of our customers uh, in that curve, in that adoption curve. Mm -hmm. Cool. Now, do you do this through a cloud approach, a, you know, a cloud offering? You do it through you know, libraries of software, on-prem? What are sort of the models of how people work with you? So it, it's it's agnostic. Uh, we have, you know, you can get us off the, the Amazon marketplace. Um, and we also have a an on-prem offering as well. So that's one of the major advantages of data swirling uh, that I mentioned earlier. Because it can work on-prem or in disconnected or air-gapped environments, Companies, uh, large financial institutions, banks, insurance companies, uh, security companies, uh, some of these are our, our customers, are able to use our product without the concern of where is the information, where is the data going. Um, so it can work on-prem. It can work in the cloud. Uh, we focused more in the early stages of our company on the, uh, the larger industries, the more disconnected environments, because there's, we have more of an advantage there and there's, there's less, uh, less or fewer solutions in the market for, for those types of environments. Uh, so definitely, you know, like financial services, insurance, those have been our our prime markets early on. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, being able to operate in on prem is super important for some of those larger and you know security yeah. sensitive enterprises. And surprisingly, still a very large part. Maybe not so surprisingly, but a very large part of the market, even for companies, you know, moving to full containerization and using Kubernetes. Uh, many of them still run a lot on prem. There's a lot of stuff on prem. As much as the cloud is, you know, taking taking hold, taking you yeah. know a foothold and very popular. What well, what are some of the things I'm curious? So I'm running a Kubernetes environment. Maybe I've been doing this for a little while, a year plus, two years, something like that. And I plug in your technology to what I'm doing. What are the typical things that people find pretty quickly? Uh, 
because they're using your stuff. Yeah. Usually there, you know, there's always, we, we've had this with a number of customers where they install the product and there was some nagging issue that they had for, for weeks and couldn't figure it out, uh, whether it was a uh, repeated slowness on their website or um, uh, a specific application that was, was crashing constantly and they couldn't figure it out. And there's so many different reasons why those things can happen. And there's, there's an endless list of the types of problems you can encounter. Um, but wh- a lot of it is due to the fact that many of the tools they were using beforehand don't really see the, the true root cause, the initial uh, you know, nexus of the problem. What they'll normally see with their in-house observability stuff or some of the older tools is, is the first symptom of the problem. So, okay, a pod is repeatedly crashing or you're seeing slowness on a website. But where's that coming from? Is it from a specific problem with the application's uh, resource allocation? Does it have to do with how it's interacting with, with other containers on a specific node or server? Uh, these are the things that we can see because we're on the edge and we're analyzing everything in real time. Uh, we can see everything that's happening and we have no constraint as to offload, you know, so many of the tools today will offload those resources and they can't, uh, excuse me, offload that data. And they can't take everything because it's it's uh, resource prohibitive. Uh, we're able to see everything happening in real time. Excellent. What, what are what are the kind of resources this takes to operate? Um, are we talking about something significant in terms of load on systems? You know, libraries that it has to go into code. What are some of the requirements that to be implemented? Our, our mantra is to be non-intrusive, so very low. It's built cloud native. Everything is built as a set of microservices. It's deployed through a daemon set, so there's nothing permanently installed on any of the nodes. We essentially have a, a, a data collector on every node. And then our, our AI engines or the analyzers collectors, those are microservices which scale up and down with the environment. Um, and so it's it's negligible resource consumption. You can use Socivio to see the, the resource consumption of all of our microservices. Um, and our, our customers, again, are these are large financial institutions, insurance companies who are, are very uh, cognizant of what they're putting on their environments. And we haven't had any issues to date with uh, with installation. So it sounds like you don't have to do anything to modify or include extra code in my containers. I can do that in the clusters mm-hmm. nodes that I'm setting up. Yeah, no broken mm-hmm. artifacts, no, no, uh, no code injection. Uh, the only thing that you would have to do, if you'd like, is give elevated permissions to uh, make changes. So we do offer recommendations. They're through the kubectl uh, action. And if you'd like to do that, then we would need the permissions to do so. But that's the only, only thing. And if you don't want to use that, you don't have to give it. Okay. I would think that also helps with stability code, right? You're not having to inject or be part of people's code that they're putting in their in containers or in their own code builds. Right. Excellent. We'll talk about, so how do people get started with you? Um, you offer free accounts, access to the technology to try, try for a while. How do you work with folks? Yeah. So standard, uh, the product comes with a one month, uh, free trial for our premium version. So there's a community version and a premium version. You can download the installer on our website, www.sociv.io. Um, very easy to install, takes a couple minutes. If you'd like us to be there with you, you can reach out and contact us. We're happy to, to, to be there, but uh, very simple to, to do so. Um, and as I mentioned, it comes with a one month free trial of the premium version. So all of the insights, recommendations, uh, that analytics level, that is part of the, the premium version. Uh, but our community version looks very much like a typical observability tool with very granular metrics and and plenty of of data and insights that you can use Uh, so we do encourage we have plenty of users using it for free we like that we get feedback from them Uh, so even if you just want a a good observability tool uh, we encourage you to download it and use it and uh, get the premium version if you'd like as well but yeah Okay, perfect, perfect. And just to let folks know, um, your website is sosiv.io, correct? Correct. Good, excellent. Well, it's been fantastic talking with you, uh, Nuri, and it's a great space to be in, right? Folks are looking for help and uh, you know improve their environments and manageability of it and insights, what's, what's going on, what they need to do to make it better or, or solve those nagging issues that have been hanging around for a while that we can't figure out, right? Yep. Good. Well, thanks for joining us. And I hope folks will check out a free account. Remember, the site is uh, sosiv.io. So, yep. All right. Thank you, sir. Thanks. We'll talk to you again Thank soon. You Come much. back. Yeah. Thanks for having me, Mitch. And I hope Alan's doing well. Thank you. Appreciate it.
DevOps.com is the number one online destination for DevOps education and community building. DevOps.com covers all aspects of DevOps, including DevOps best practices and tools, DevOps culture, DevSecOps, business impact, continuous testing, continuous delivery, and more. DevOps.com has the largest collection of original DevOps content, featuring breaking news, blog posts, podcasts, and more. Visit www.devops.com to learn more. DevOps.com, where the world meets DevOps. Hi, everyone. Welcome to another episode of DevOps Unbound. DevOps, Un De DevOps Unbound is a every other week video show where we spend about 40 or 45 minutes talking about relevant topics in DevOps. DevOps Unbound is sponsored by our good friends at Chisentis and has been since day one. And we're very thankful to Chisentis for uh, their sponsorship and uh, help with the show. More than just you know saying they're a sponsor or writing a check, Chisentis is intimately involved with us in helping us pick our topics, finding guests, and just keeping the show on track because it's not an easy thing. So many thanks to Leonir Norval and the rest of the Chisentis gang for helping us. Um, this week's show is a great show. It's all about feature flags. We're going to jump into feature flags in a second. But first, I want to introduce you to this great panel. Starting us off as a frequent guest here on DevOps Unbound. We love having him on. He always has great, great insights and things to say. It's our friend Brian Dawson. Brian, welcome. Thank I've you for that. having me again. Mm -hmm. Brian, why don't you give people a little bit of your background, if you don't mind? Yeah, I, I, you know, a bit about my background is I, I I started my my you know journey as a developer, actually creating console games. So it was what we now know as PlayStation, which which I'll talk a bit about later. But that really triggered. That was my first experience with what you would call kind of the the rudimentary days of sort of feature flags, pragmas, etc. I eventually went on to the company that founded Subversion and there got an opportunity to go out to a number of clients and help them implement continuous integration, continuous delivery, and, uh, and more modern more modern practices. And then uh, and then today I work with a with a bevy of great partners in the blockchain space at a company called Ripple. Excellent. Thank you, Brian. Next up is a first timer on DevOps Unbound, but she's she works with a company that's not new to us here at TechStrong. One, actually, they were the second sponsor of DevOps.com in 2013, 2014. And that's CloudBees, and this is Hope Lynch from CloudBees. Welcome, Hope. Thank you. I, as you said, I'm at CloudBees. Long career in technology. I, I often tell people if if there's a job you've done in technology from uh, pulling wire, working on servers, coding, pretty much everything. I've touched it at one time or another. Um, spent some time at Cisco, spent some time at Red Hat. My most recent role before coming to CloudBees, and at CloudBees, I am in uh, product marketing. Uh, but before that, which is why I was so interested in this conversation, I was a product manager for an IoT platform. So microservices, feature flagging uh, was a pretty critical part of how we were getting our jobs done. Absolutely. And of course, the whole DevOps of things, if you will, you know, bringing DevOps sort of ways of looking at things like feature flags to IoT devices is, is such a big uh it's a it's a new frontier we're going to be exploring. I'm actually in the middle of writing something up about DevOps World coming up later this month, and you know the theme there is DevOps Remix, and and we're also doing another show the month after called DevOps Experience and DevOps of Things and and this whole DevOps everywhere, and the, the, these two ideas run in together where we're seeing DevOps go where no. DevOps has gone before, right? And, and into IoT, into the edge. And 
feature flags, of course, plays a, a big role in that. Testing plays a big role in that. It's going to really going to change a lot of patterns that we've developed. Anyway, thanks, Hope, for joining. And let me introduce you now to our third panel member today. He's also been on uh, DevOps Unbound before. You may recognize a handsome beard and mustache. It's our friend, Adam Kelsey. Hey, Adam, welcome. Thanks. Thanks for having me. Um, so a little bit about myself. I started as a developer in my career way back in the dark ages before cookies existed in uh, in browsers. Um, and I uh, currently lead uh, some of our product management organization at uh, Tricentis. I've been building products exclusively for developers for about 15 years now. And Thanks, and man. Alan, you missed an opportunity to coin a term. You should have called it thing ops. You know what? It's not too late. <laughs> you see, if, if Mitchell, check out of thingops.com. I've already, I just registered. I okay. got it. Got it. <laughs> that's that's going to be really popular with IoT crowd. I'll just tell I you bet, that. I bet. I <laughs> bet. But you know, Adam, in a, in a case of what's old is new again, if Google has their way, we might be, be doing away with cookies, right? And, and, uh, well, yeah, so, it, you know, we'll see what happens with cookies. So let me, and then bringing up, certainly last but not, certainly not least, is my co-host for DevOps and Baron, as well as one of my partners here at Textron Group, my longtime friend Mitchell Ashley. Hey, Mitch, welcome. Good to be here, Alan. Uh, great panel. I'm I, I'm not going to tell you when I started developing and what wasn't around back then. That's a whole nother day. But I'm excited today because it's Flag Day on and DevOps Unbound. Flag Day. Talking about feature yeah. flags. So let's get right into it. All right. There were there were punch cards involved, though, right, Mitch? <laughs> <laughs> um, at least one deck of them, yes. Yeah, I remember they see. <laughs> anyway, um, guys, we're here to talk about feature flags today, and it's going to be a great conversation. You know, our audience, I, I pride myself that our tech strong audience is rather sophisticated from a DevOps point of view. We are DevOps.com, you know, and technology in general. But there might be people who are watching out here who say, I think I know what a feature flag is. What does that have to do with cookies, right? Um, they, they're not 100% sure. So who wants to tackle? You know what, Hope, I'm afraid we're going to call on you to lead it off if you don't mind. Why don't you kind of baseline for the audience? What what are we talking about here with feature right. flags? Right. Um, I will say it in this way. So if you are deploying software, and you don't want to make a big bang deployment, or you don't want to, let's say, test everything in production on everyone at the same time. If you use feature flags, you can target your deployment. You can have a very small test group. So if you want to test with, uh, let's say, an affinity group that knows they want to be your beta customers every time, you can roll out to them only, see how it performs, and if, it, if it's going well, roll it out more widely, maybe also in a targeted fashion. But if not, then you can have an easier way just to uh, turn those features off and, and make your improvements. So feature flags give you a lot of control on who can see what um, uh, as your end users. And, and you can also make their experience better by sometimes um, targeted uh, improvements, targeted enhancements, just going to certain users. And I would That's add, if, if you've ever been forced to commit by your lead dev before your code was ready, <laughs> you, you feature flag something out. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Fair enough. So let me, let, me, let me play devil's advocate or shill in the audience. So what's the difference between feature flag and A-B a B testing? Oh. I'm going to jump in on that one here with you. Hope. I think one of the big differences is you don't have to deploy code with feature flags. It's already out there just enabling and disabling what's there. So uh, you might still deploy code for future features or whatever, but that's one of the big advantages is just turning things off and on without deploying any code. Yeah, I, I agree. That, that, that's certainly it. You know, I, I, we we look at, or maybe it's me, when I look at feature flags, I look at it from sort of what is the end user experience, right? 
an end user experience can have an A or a B or a C or, or you know, a multitude of different experiences, depending what flags are turned on or off. But I think another way of looking at this is what's the view from the other side of the dashboard? What's the view from the development side or the op side or the testing side even? And and how do we interpret you know, what we see with feature flags and then how does that influence what we're doing? Adam, you wanna yeah, maybe take us down that rabbit hole? Yeah, one of the things that uh, that happens a lot of times is you're as you're implementing feature flags, you're uh, you you push something out and and you run your tests and find out that uh, oh, I I only tested one of the paths um if the feature flags and it and it starts to get even messier when you get dozens of flags, hundreds of flags, thousands of flags. Um, and how do you how do you test all of those um, and uh, and ensure that you're actually testing all the different configurations and all the different possibilities? Um, and uh, and it's a mess, especially as you start having flags that are should be retired. They've been there too long. They're no longer used. You know, do do I even toggle this flag on um, to run my test because this thing's been around too long now? Um, and uh, and you nobody's know, flipped it on or off. So so I mean, you need need good feature flag management. You need a good understanding of what all the flags are, what they do, what should be uh, in in different scenarios, and what aren't. And without a good map of that, um, it's impossible to set your flags correctly. Whether you're talking about production usage or testing or or anything else. And, and Adam, if I if I could add, I'm glad you brought up um, QA and also proper management, right? Because pop properly created, configured and manage when we talk about the value to QA, um, you know, there's there's a number of things. One thing, for instance, I've run into a lot as Agile and DevOps and, and you know, two week sprints really started to take hold is that uh, QA often has a hard time keeping up, right? Um, so one of the things using QA as an example, you know, that you're able to do is you're able to deploy the features that you have the ability to test and then, you know, you can you can toggle test, toggle off for production test, then toggle in production, which speaks to an overall value of feature flags. There's a similar benefit to the people that are responsible um, for deployment. You don't necessarily have to wait um, for a feature to be fully tested, right? You can deploy the package and then the team can turn on features as they feel they're ready to be rolled out to production, either to, to a whole group or as Hope mentioned, um, progressively to other groups. So I like to say there's there's um, um, feature flags enable continuous everything for everybody in the SDLC. Yeah, and we're I, not I, not I building a big bang deployment. Sorry, Adam. Yeah. I, I've long said that uh, that you can't have a continuous delivery uh, unless you have the three legged stool of continuous testing, feature flagging, and observability. You have to know that what you put out there is working. You have to be able to control what people see and you have to be able to test it all. And, and you have to do that all in both production and in lower environments. You know, we used to use, I test in production as a, as a pejorative um, and now it's it's a way of life. But the thing is, is you can't test only in production and, and right. you have to test everything. I mean, you have to test to make sure your feature flags are working. Did you actually right. toggle off the thing you thought you were toggling off? Right. And I think going back to, though, the point around A-B testing, um, A-B often is, uh, for some organizations, a trial balloon. We're going to change something. We're going to change something relatively small. Who does it resonate with? At that point, often, you don't really need the QA team involved. They're not going to do integration testing or end-to-end -end testing on something like that. But then when you start to dive deeper and you say, we're choosing B, everyone rally around that and we're gonna swarm and build, we're, we're gonna build B and deliver that to a wider range of customers. That gives a lot of those QA teams enough runway to understand what's coming and, and hopefully prepare for it a little more so they're not left behind as much as they sometimes are. Yeah, there's there's two different ways that uh, that that happens. I mean, you've got either um, A/B testing as I'm trying to decide which way I'm going to do, and in which case your QA probably should have tested both of them and make sure they both work. But also, um, you know, I increasingly see feature flagging and A/B testing and is a 
as a substitute for some testing. Hey, let's let's spin this out to two or three users and find out if anybody screams. Let's let our users be our QA. Um, you know that that may be appropriate in some things. It's probably not appropriate if you're testing. You know nuclear missile alerts in, in Hawaii and you uh, oh yeah you let's not tell that. everybody that you're that's what that was <laughs> <laughs> I remember that one yeah um so let, let let us now jump into you know I feel like we've laid a good foundation here on feature flex you know the 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 uh, title of today's show is feature flags and microservices oil and water you know we, we've seen feature flags obviously become sort of mainstream DevOps. I think we haven't said it, if, and if we haven't, I'll say it now. It's because it, it's, it directly relates to one of the fundamental DevOps principles, which is feedback loops, right? I can't think of a better example of feedback loops than feature flags, actually. Now, but the world's changed since we first you know, read the Phoenix Project uh, almost 10 years ago now, right? And um, cloud native microservices has burst on the scene. We are seeing these monolithic applications being deconstructed and, and redeployed as a stream of microservices that coordinate and work together. There are some people who say, yeah, microservices doesn't work so good with feature flags. Well, if you believe they do, let's hear why. Or if you believe they do not, let's hear why not. What's the problem? If you believe they do, let's hear why. Um, yeah. I'll throw it open to any of you to kick it off, and, and I'm, I'm so, interested in everyone's opinion. I think it's important, Alan, that, um, that we kind of subdivide the space. And as you said earlier, I want to kind of underscore um, – we, we've talked a lot about user facing feature flags or feature flagging user facing features, right? But let's also keep in mind that that um, we can feature flag back end and we can feature back at feature flag back end at almost any level of granularity. So I'd say on one side of that argument, when we say microservices doesn't work with feature flags, well, not necessarily. If I run a microservice, I can feature flag out components or functionality within that microservice as long as I ensure I'm preserving my interface contract um, with the people that are consuming my service, right? But then now when you start to talk about what I'll call system level feature flags, right, which are usually, those could still be back end, but I'm going to grossly say that those are your user facing feature flags. Now, what happens with microservices, of course, is you can have 5, 10, 15, 50 different uh, microservices, many of those run and developed by different teams that all roll up to represent a user flow or a user facing feature, right? So now we get into, we've broken into these individual teams to enable autonomy and velocity, but wait a sec, how do we establish that there's a feature flag that we wanna set to, to turn on or off a system feature across 50 microservices, right? So now you do kind of get attention because to feature flag out that user facing feature across those 50 microservices, now you break some of that autonomy or atomic benefit of microservices. So I lay all that out to kind of set the stage and say, well, I, I know we have solutions and counters. There is, there is a, 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 some real validity to the perception that feature flags and microservices are oil and water. Yeah. And I, I believe that. You know, uh, pretend there are two of me. I'm an A-B test right now. <laughs> so I believe that microservices can work with feature flags if you are using it to validate changes in microservices. So if you have so many that it is hard for the team to manage, and, I, and I've been with teams that have had challenges just managing uh, that distribution. If you set it up so internally, um, it can validate changes to individual microservices in your production environment, fantastic. The con for me is one of the things that microservices was supposed to get us away from was uh, all of the deep coupling that, that we've seen. Yeah. 
um, and the additional complexity. So this is taking us back sort of in the direction of story service oriented architecture um, may work for some, may not work for others. Yeah. I, I, I'd question the entire premise that, uh, that anyone thinks that these things shouldn't be work, used together. Mm -hmm. um, I, I think you'd be hard pressed to find a developer who has implemented microservices at any sort of scale, um, who thinks that, uh, that feature flagging um, or, or some way of controlling deployments, uh, you know, as, as Brian pointed out, you, you've got the, uh, the contract changed how do you ensure that the, the the clients are in sync and that that's part of that that decoupling of the of the tight coupling um if if i have to deploy all of the the clients or all the dependent services every time i make a change it's uh it's a mess and i'm going to sound like a, an advertisement for feature flag management companies here but um if you don't have a good way of managing your feature flags if you've built some homegrown system where you know it worked for for 10 or 12 or 100 flags once you start getting into these complex webs of there's 16 downstream dependencies and all the flags need to be toggled at the same time and in the right order um, for that to happen, that's, that's going to be a mess. And then, you know, again, sounding like an ad for the, the company I work for, um, you know, testing those and, and having good contract tests and knowing that, uh, that the different systems are able to, to uh, use the right API contracts and that they're getting the ones that they thought they got um, when you do change those, those flags. Um, is is crucial. Um, otherwise, you're going to have downstream problems and and unexplained stability and and very 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 hard to debug things. You know, Alan, I, I remember there were maybe a handful of articles making that argument. Right, that's been a few years back, maybe three or five or something like that. And, and to me, it's it's run amok, run uncontrolled. Feature flags could bring chaos to any environment, just like you know, duplicative microservices and, you know, subdividing things too far, going too far with it. You know, a big advantage can be our worst enemy. I think that the thing, and I'm not making the premise that they aren't made for microservices. Of course, you can use them in microservices or not, right? Uh, but I think what it does is add another layer of complexity to it. And what you were saying, Adam, about you have to manage that across the team not just within a team right you could have people implementing duplicate feature flags right just imagine the folks in an in an ops environment whether it's dev or sre or an ops person you know with hopefully an observability or platform trying to put all this together right what versions of what code were we running when um what was serverless if that was maybe in the mix and what were the feature flags that were set at that time did anybody log it or, or have some way to track all that so it does add another layer of complexity so i think you've got to be you know apply good engineering but also kind of product engineering product management across the team to uh, bring a little bit of discipline to it so it just doesn't become yeah insanity right and i and i think you know also there's a bit of kind of um human interaction i think you know you've probably heard me mitch we've done a few of these saying at the end of the day humans are endpoints of code right they're where it's created they're where it lands and what does happen as you coordinate feature flags across these multiple services at the end of the day you need to enable teams to coordinate right you think about the scenario where maybe i have a feature flag where i've 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 um you know, we're trying to take a piece out of the system. I flag something out that within my microservices turns off a sub function effectively to put it generically. Now I call into that interface contract is the same, but I'm getting a null value for one of my variables, one of my, you know, and, and all of a sudden my service dies. I don't know why. Um, so again, this is where you have to have um, systems and processes to coordinate those flags. You have to have people working together. Um, and, and then I'll get to what we haven't talked about, I think, for the audience. Here's where interfaces start to become important. If I recall Martin Fowler's initial blog about, about what has now become feature flags and ultimately feature management, I believe he did talk to having to manage that at code level at scale, right? Um, and I think it's implied and most of our audience probably gets it, but let's call out that when we talk about enterprise feature management and enterprise feature management across microservices, a UI and UX to check, control, and toggle those flags um, is critical, right? But it's not inherent in the definition. But then again, when we go to enterprise feature management, one thing that you should think about here is um, not only a dashboard to turn them on and off, but a dashboard that provides a shared view and, and leads to a shared understanding 
of what's on, what's off, what's flagged, et cetera. Well, and, and I think that goes, to, I'm sorry, go ahead, Adam. It, it, it's not just useful in this. So it, it, it's crucial in, in order to, if I'm going to change an API contract and I'm going to, to break things down the road, if I can, can uh, run two versions of that, that API so that uh, somebody can, can then run against either one and provide a deprecation in order right. for them to effectively roll this out and, and manage this across the enterprise, you have to do it through through feature flagging. The the upstream teams need to be able to not do these big bang things. And whether it's a feature flag through literally implemented in code or whether they're treating their deployments as a feature flag, um, you know, Ho Hope, do you have a lot of people using feature flags to to kind of manage deprecation of things? Have you seen that very much at CloudBees? Um, at CloudBees, I'm a, I'm a little more removed from the day-to-day, -day, um, but I think there are a few. In previous organizations, I think it was something that was always a goal, but was hard for the teams that I was working with to do well, right? Um, it was more of um, a manual task for some of them, um, but I think partly because feature flags for them at that time were a lot newer and they were more focused on the implementation. How do we clean up all of these flags that we see out here? Um, but it did definitely help. Um, it did help with, with branching, right? So once you have the flag turned off, we don't have, have all of these long lived feature branches. That part was more automated, but, um, but not so much with, um, other deprecation. Yeah. Well, mm -hmm. Brian called it enterprise feature management. That that idea of not just what one of the great things if you're if you're using an enterprise feature system and it's across the entire enterprise is I can go look and see does anyone still have this feature implemented? Is am, yes. is this code path now dead? And so yes. where where I might be able to look in my microservice and go oh nobody's hitting the microservice it's it's safe to turn off this version. Is it though? Is this a microservice that somebody hits once every six months? And mm -hmm. yeah, I turn it off, but it breaks. But if I can go look at a source of truth and say, hey, everybody has moved their feature flags onto the new version. Now it's safe to actually do that deprecation. That's cute. Oh yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And and looking at which flags are off, which, which flags um, have basically been removed, you know, that generally is saying we have accepted this. This is our path to production now. Um, that has been useful for a lot of teams because it's already somewhat confusing for some, depending on how they've implemented their feature flag management. That I think is always a, 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 a source of conversation in most organizations. But if they have um, their continuous integration, continuous delivery paths mostly work through and they have integrated uh, feature flagging into that. And every team has understood um, this is part of our way of working. I, I think it speeds everyone up. It's, it's a great practice. Too. And I know, I know Alan needs to shift our subject, but I want to jump in real quick to underscore because Alan asked earlier, how do feature flags affect the experience for people that are upstream? And I think you, you, you and Adam hit on a key thing. Ultimately, while it's some extra work to coordinate, it can simplify your code. It can make your code less brittle. It can reduce branching. It can make your code less complex. It can free you from having to, to manage deprecated code um, um, to the same level. Absolutely. But, you know, I think one of the things we've skirted around, but we really haven't hit, head on and, and I think it directly relates to the whole microservices thing is the issue of scale right when we talk about feature flags you know th this is not just a, a, is the background red or blue is my button rounded corner or square corner you know like interface kinds of things like that but the the behind the code or the the UI UX I mean the, the, the sheer scale of feature flags. At some level, feature flags as it relates to microservices has almost been a victim of its own success in that once we start using them and we and we see the, the good, <laughs> right? We got that feedback. We see what we can do with more, it. More, more, more. You know, <laughs> button down the hatches, man. We just keep adding more and more feature flags. I, I've seen, you know, we've done uh, 
series in the past videos with, with some of the feature flag companies and, you know, the amount, the sheer number of feature flags being deployed is literally in the billions at this point, right? On, I think on that's a very the, regular basis. We've met the enemy and they are us, right? They're yeah. <laughs> and now, so, so when you take that kind of scale and then it bumps into microservices, which is trying to, you know, scaling microservices is yet another issue. We could probably do another DevOps I'm bound on, right? It really kind of is oil and watery a little bit, right? It really does. You know, how? And look, the easy answer is, well, you got to use a feature flag program for this because the scale <laughs> is just, you know, yes, you have to use a feature flag program. That's a That's a no-brainer. But what does that feature flag program have to have that really allows you to to work at that scale in microservices kind of architecture uh, environments and still be able to make the testers happy and the developers happy and the security folks happy, as well as the end users? It, right? it, it has to have knowledge. It has to have knowledge of everything that's out there and be able to expose that. It, it, once you have tens of thousands of flags, where are they being used? Who's using them? How often are they being used? What code pads are active? Which ones are not? Which ones should we be retiring? And and that's where building your own seems kind of nuts. I mean, look, you can build your own. Um, you you but you know you can build your own credit card processing system too. But unless that's your core business, you know, go go use something from someone else. Um, you know, whether it's it's Cloudbees or, or one of their fine competitors. Um, you know, it, it's. Uh, at scale with microservices, knowing what things are being used and where is just crazy, crazy important. I would add to that, Adam, and it's also what are they for? What is this? What is this feature flag for? And do we all use it the same way? There, there's also a school of thought of treat um, feature flags as having a life cycle. Right. Because they may be introduced for some internal testing. I think you gave that that example, Adam. Um, but it could be for beta features that are being used by certain users in the market. We could, you know, flip the flag and be in on release day the next day. It could be for duplicate. You could actually have duplicate code, right, with variations of it um, using feature flags to turn on or manage which ones are turned on in what scenario. But I think you want to avoid the problem of, you know, some feature flags are meant to stay around, but not all feature flags, right? They, they do need to have an end of life. Um, if they were for a, a specific purpose like that. So, but, but that's that sort of life cycle management treated as a pro product or a product or part of the product. Um, so I think that's part of what you're talking about, Adam, it's knowing what's there, but also why is it there and what's it doing and how are we going to use it today, tomorrow, and then maybe stop using it if we do. I think, and if I um, may, Mitch, I, I think uh, you call out a key thing when you talk about change. So, so, Alan, before we get to kind of what does the solution need, I'll, you know, hit a couple of things. Look, you, 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 you oftentimes feature flag uses growth from bottom up. I think now we're starting to see it come in from sort of top level engineering practices down or product. Um, I think in either of those similar a DevOps transition, you get a point where you need to have a thoughtful, deliberate rollout. Right. So you need to have change management. You need to have communication. You need to have alignment around the philosophy of why we use it. What do we flag? Um, and then to your point, uh, Mitch, a life cycle, a couple of things I'd like to call out hope before I hand it right over to you is going to be when we talk about what ideally do you need to see in a fee in an enterprise feature management solution? Well, we need, you know, we need um, language support, right? We need language, but we, we need stubs ideally that allow us to easily integrate those feature flags across possibly the multiple languages or across our tech stack, right? Ideally, you would have those stubs be able to grab some of that intelligence that could then be rendered um, that, that Adam would call out. Right. You need a, um, a a rich, you know, um, um, easy to use uh, user interface that hopefully can either extract or enable you to tag some additional context around those feature flags, so on and so on. But uh, but hope I'll stop there because I realized you were you were jumping in. Oh, that's OK. That's OK. Um, one of the other things that I think is really important that is sometimes overlooked when talking about 
uh, feature flagging, and especially if it's a homegrown solution, is uh, what is your governance model? How are you addressing security? How are you addressing uh, role-based access? How are you uh, auditing to understand what changes were made? That's something that's relatively simpler to do if you have a small team. But if you're talking about dozens and dozens of microservices and thousands of featured flags across a large enterprise without having some mechanisms in place to manage those things, you can quickly lose control of, of what's happening and, and, and how uh, your processes are rolling. Yeah, I, I remember the first time that uh, we started talking about feature flagging and somebody was saying, well, we should look at some of these vendors that are out there that are doing this. I, I said, that's insane. Why do I need to outsource my if statement? And then, uh, and, and then we ended up with a few dozen of these across a few dozen different microservices. And I went, oh, that's why I need to, <laughs> it's not outsourcing my if statement. It's outsourcing all of the decision-making and understanding that, that's behind that if statement. Right. right. Or providing yeah, infrastructure absolutely. for the decision-making around that, that if statement. That's a good one to outsource my if statement. <laughs> <laughs> I like it. <laughs> but guys, let me, you know, we, we, we're more almost done here. There's a couple of things I want to make sure we we hit for our audience. And, you know, when we talk about scale and feature flags is a scale issue today, right? If you're using feature flags, you're probably using them at some scale, best practices. This, you know, a spreadsheet isn't the option, Adam, to your point about home growth. I can't imagine people using feature flags and microservices and these things and trying to track this stuff like in a spreadsheet. You've got to be using, and there are, there are some fine feature flag management solutions out there. CloudBees has one, of course, as Hope mentioned, but there, there are others too. I'm not here to endorse one over the other. I'm just saying use one, right? You can't be serious about using feature flags without a feature flag management program. You can't be serious about using feature flags in a microservices or architecture architecture based application without having some feature flag management product that really integrates in your your development team your QA as i mentioned before security folks all of that now that all being said what is the, what the, you know have we has feature flags matured to the point where we see sort of a best practices, right? And if so, what are some of these best practices beyond using a real program to manage them? Anybody? I, I feel that one future best practice, let's say, um, there are a lot of organizations who are seeing future flags aligned to features Absolutely, because it's called feature flags, right? But understanding how that is tied to your business and what your business wants and your business outcomes is also really important because focusing at, at too low of a level may not let you tie back to what your overall organization is actually trying to accomplish. And if there's a major change, um, being a able to narrow down uh, which work is tied to those flags that affects that business outcome could be pretty critical uh, in the future versus someone going through, even with an application and having to pick through and make those associations. And, and, and I'll add two that I think are extensive of some comments earlier. I think w one is, Align around a what and why, similar to next step kind of down from the business objectives across these multiple, you know, uh, two pizza teams, microservices teams, however we used to describe them. Above that, there should be a, uh, we view feature flags as this, we use them in this case. You can even categorize or type them so you have an internal lexicon um, to talk about it. And then again, what a system or a solution won't necessarily take care of you alone is going to be how do we communicate what we're doing across those, which will then get to my 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 uh, 
my second best practice that I would recommend. And that's to do regular review, cross-functional, cross-team reviews of the feature flags that have been established, evaluating, you know, one, how they impact other systems, two, um, are they still needed? Um, and uh, so two of those, pra those two practices can help better align on how do we establish and maintain them? And then how do we, how do we track and deprecate those uh, so that feature flags don't end up creating more technical debt than reducing tech debt? I, I'm, I'm going to disagree a little bit that I, I don't think feature flags are a solved problem. I don't think that this is, I don't think we know enough about the problem domain to have a lot of good best practices and what is considered a best practice today may be a terrible practice once we start learning enough about it. And you know, we, we've got we've got feature flags used in so many different scenarios. There's there's phased rollouts. There's a that's part of A/B testing. It's part of uh, you know all sorts of different things. And treating them all in one way or or trying to to establish a practice for for feature flags um, is probably going to narrow our thinking down enough that this is such a a relatively new thing that. We don't really understand the the behaviors and the and the governance models and the uh, the human behaviors on the back end of this well enough to start saying these are the best ways to do things and we should we should let teams explore and uh, and find their own best ways um, right now that uh, that trying to to set any sort of a best practice maybe is kind of restrictive in the in the growth of this and in our understanding of how this stuff works. Fair. Yeah, I, I worry. I, I get the point, but I worry that it could that 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 uh, that there's a uh, you need to strike a balance between freedom and exploration, and and to to Alan's point from earlier, just having people create feature flags, littering the code with feature flags, right? And uh, and I do so. Yeah, I think that's an important point, Alan uh, Adam. Um, but I'd say that, but I call out to people: there has to be a balance, right? Um, just letting people run. Um, can create a ball of yarn that's high, hard to hard to unravel. Yeah, and I'm going to concur, and it brings to mind um, in some organizations where people say we want to experiment, we want to innovate, right? Experimentation and innovation are processes and practices mm -hmm. to find a way to feed back what you've learned, how you've improved into the organization. Um, it's it's not a free for all. And even with, I think, best practices, um, hearkening back to Agile, you look at something, you say, okay, here's the best practice in the industry today. Let's try it. We see these items don't work for us. We're not going to treat this as if it is, you know, something we can't deviate from. But Everyone aligning around uh, a core and at least trying those things helps you find out to me faster what doesn't work in a way that you can feed that back out into the organization. Yeah, I just I just worry that we're going to end up like we have with Agile, where um, people go, well, Agile means Scrum and we're going to implement yeah. Scrum and, and we're we're abusing developers um, with Scrum now, and ceremonies. And that, I agree. That we're not going to get past that. <laughs> Uh, yes. And that, that, that we're repeating that. Scrum. I don't want to repeat that same pattern with feature flags. I I I bristle at anything called the best practice, yeah. you know, partly for that reason. Yeah. No. I and I. You know, we've seen it with DevOps and Agile, right? No matter how time, how much you disclaim, look, these are general guidelines. Bring them in and implement them in a way that's fit for your organization. Yet, time and time again, for Agile and DevOps, people will come and give me, give me the canned food spam version of this, please. So I can go deploy a thousand times a week. And you're like, no, that's just not going to. Yeah. So I get you on that. Adam. Uh, yeah. I, Look, I, I don't I'm going to add one thing and being wrong. I've, I've, I've been wrong at least once before. So, so it's okay with me <laughs> if it happens again. So I'll cap this off, Alan, this way is I don't think any of us want the dogma, right? I think that's what we want to avoid. Um, I actually I have a different thought. I think we need patterns, not best practices. Mm -hmm. Think of how developers think of you know, singleton is this, et cetera. I think that's that's what we need for feature flags because there are great patterns for how people use this. It isn't just kill switches and functional features, switches, et cetera. There's more to how you use it. I think that would advance the state of the art. The best. I don't think there's a book on that yet. And maybe <laughs> someone here wants to write it. Let's do it. Be careful what you ask for. Um, <laughs> hey, guys, this has been a fascinating conversation. I, I think it's obviously a topic that we can talk a lot more about. 
but we don't have time today. Um, so Hope, Adam, Brian, thanks for joining us on this uh, episode of DevOps Unbound. Thank you for watching. We hope you found this interesting and, and you've been learning a little bit about feature flags. Um, thanks to Chisentis for sponsoring this. It's always, you know, they're a great partner to have on these. And, and I think you can see why listening to our conversations. Um, I invite you to watch the next DevOps Unbound, which I think is a live roundtable edition coming up. Um, and, or depending when you watch this, it might be after, because I forget not everyone watches it the day it comes out, but you can catch future uh, episodes of DevOps Unbound. You'll also find them on techstrong.tv as well. Until then though, this is Alan Schimmel for TechStrong, as well, uh, well, as well with Mitchell Ashley and Adam Kelsey, Brian Dawson and Hope Lynch. Thanks for watching DevOps Unbound. SecurityBoulevard.com is the leading resource for news, analysis, and education on challenges facing the cybersecurity industry. SecurityBoulevard.com covers all aspects of cybersecurity, including data security, DevSecOps, cloud security, application security, network security, security threats, and more. SecurityBoulevard.com has the largest selection of security content, featuring breaking news, blog posts, podcasts, and more. Visit www.securityboulevard.com to learn more. Securityboulevard.com, home of Security Bloggers Network. This is TechStrong TV. Hey guys, thanks for the throw. We're here with Mark Sassone, who's Managing Director for Pinpoint Search Group. They're specialists in recruiting cybersecurity folks for vendors in particular, but we're going to have a little chat also about what's going on with recruitment in general. Mark, welcome to the show. Good to be here. Thanks for having me. There's more than a few cybersecurity folks out there that would want to work for vendors as well as, say, end users, but is there something unique about the attributes of somebody you're looking for who is a cybersecurity person who winds up working for a vendor? Vendors are typically going to be competing quite a bit in the marketplace for branding recognition. And so regardless of what your function is going to be at a vendor, you've got to be willing to understand that you're going to be part of a growing company. You're going to have to go sell a product and you don't have to be a salesperson to sell a product. It can be a marketing person, an engineer, whatever the case may be. You've got to meet the demands of the customer. Otherwise, there's going to be literally thousands of other vendors they can go to instead of you. Are there a lot of soft skills then that you're looking for in particular alongside the technical knowledge? And um, what turns you off from a likely candidate? Sure, there's definitely going to be soft skills required across the board. Uh, because even if you're an engineer working on code every day, there's going to be interactions that you have to have internally with folks that are customer facing that are going to need your help. And if you can't interact, if you can't make things work, be flexible, then most certainly it's going to be a difficult run for you in that particular organization in that role. So it's already hard enough to find cybersecurity people in general. So how hard is it to find um, in some cases, it sounds like you're looking for the unicorn, the person who has cybersecurity expertise with all the appropriate soft skills and you know ability to make friends with customers. Yeah, um, it's it's not difficult to find them. We we've got sourcing techniques. LinkedIn is definitely a, a great resource for us. It's more about identifying the right fit making sure that the folks that we're talking to for specific opportunities are going to be aligned in terms of what their career goals and what the skill sets are needed with respect to the company that's trying to hire. So it's more about aligning, again, career goals and, and what's needed for a specific organization versus just finding people to fill a job. 
I'm asking these questions because it seems like more and more of the security services themselves are going to be managed by vendors rather than some team working for the end user. There's a lot more managed services as a service capabilities coming out from vendors. So do you think that vendors are soon going to be at the top of the recruitment pole, as it were, in terms of absorbing the best talent that's out there to deliver those services? Quite likely. Uh, you are seeing a lot of um, MSSPs, for example, adopting SOC as a service type technologies that are being adopted by organizations that simply don't have either the purchasing power or the ability to recruit the talent internally to manage their security operations. So uh, the vendor community is definitely going to be top of the food chain. I don't want to minimize the need at the end user, but I, I'd have to agree with your assessment there. Are there things you would advise cybersecurity professionals to go do to make themselves more attractive to those types of recruiters or vendors who are looking for the, that level of expertise? Is there something in their resumes or background that you specifically look for? To be attractive, uh, I definitely advise optimizing your LinkedIn profile. It's the best personal and professional lead generation engine that you're going to have. That's how you're getting found. Um, your resume is as good as the amount of people you send it to. LinkedIn makes you identifiable to people like me so that we can assess whether we should be reaching out to you for opportunities. So that's one of the best things that you can do in terms of marketing yourself and creating your own professional brand. Do you think that cybersecurity folks that work for vendors are going to make more than they would working elsewhere? Um, no, I, I don't think so. I think it depends on what your role is going to be within a vendor versus what your role is going to be at the end user. But if you're talking about cybersecurity or leaving the industry and going and doing a different job in some other area of tech or otherwise, Cybersecurity is one of the best paid jobs that you're going to have, period. There's intense competition. Everybody talks about the talent gap. Uh, essentially, there's about three and a half million unfilled cybersecurity jobs globally at any given time. Uh, and you've got, again, 2,000 plus vendors. And that's not talking about the end users that are all competing for individuals with specific talent, specifically in security, and not just talent, but experience, understanding the ecosystem, understanding how to operate the go-to-market functions as well. So because of the competition, basic supply and demand theory, uh, yeah, I mean, you're going to get paid pretty good in, in this industry. Do you think that AI is going to have an impact on any of this? Because we hear all the time about how more of the functions will be automated. So will there be this big gap in demand and supply forever? Or is that going to narrow over time as things become more automated? I'm not an engineer. What, what I can say is from my experience, Mike, um, as technology develops, even if something gets automated that's basically mundane, something else is going to have to be taken over by a human to manage that automation process. There's gonna be additional components that develop. The threat landscape that we all have to contend with right now is constantly developing. There are motivated criminals, there are motivated nation state actors that wanna find any and every way to exploit uh, data or whatever the case may be. And humans are gonna to have to find a way to adapt constantly. So we may automate stuff that, again, becomes mundane, but there's going to be another challenge. And so there's going to be jobs in cybersecurity that come up in the next decade that don't even exist today. That's my, that's my assessment. Last question. Is there something you see job candidates doing in the cybersecurity space consistently that more or less torpedoes their ability to get that next job? And what is that? What is that? Uh, yeah, absolutely. And it's overestimating your value. While there's a, gap, a talent gap, while you may be in high demand, you go into a conversation 
with a hiring manager or a hiring authority and the interview, and you don't focus at least initially on selling yourself more than asking questions and being the interviewer, you're going to get passed over. Don't turn down a job you haven't been offered yet. And what that means is go, go for the win. Go for the offer every single time. And then you have the opportunity to turn that off down. Plain and simple. Versus giving the interviewer or the hiring company the choice of making the decision. Give yourself that choice by getting the offer. If you're not gunning for it, there's a chance someone else is and they're going to take them over you. All right. Your biggest competitor may very well be yourself. Hey, Mark, thanks for being on the show. Thanks for having me, Mike. All right. Back to you guys in the studio. This is TechStrong TV. Hey guys, thanks for the thrill. We're here with Cody Cornell as the Chief Strategy Officer for Swimlane. We're talking about incident response, incident management, and how things are getting a little bit more complex in this exciting world of cybersecurity that we currently live in. Cody, welcome to the show. Thanks, happy to be here. Fatigue has always been an issue, whether you're working in traditional IT or dealing with cybersecurity incidents, but it seems like it's becoming a much more pressing problem lately. We're generating more alerts than ever. It seems like we have more things that are monitoring different things, and that all sounds good, but sometimes it's too much of a good thing. So what is the best approach to incident management these days in cybersecurity, and what should people be thinking about to kind of limit the fatigue without compromising the quality of the capability. Yeah, I, and I think it's something that a lot of organizations are, are looking for answers to, right? And, and you, obviously, the, the vendor community is large and broad, uh, and there's lots of different voices out there. But to your point, you know, the amount of telemetry we're producing right now is unprecedented, and it doesn't look like it's slowing down anytime soon. And I think most organizations have come to the kind of conclusion that, it doesn't matter how many people I have, there's still too much information to manage. So I have to find ways of doing prioritization and autom automation and things along those lines to do it. So I think what we're seeing folks kind of adopt is, you know, obviously from our perspective, being an automation company, that, that they feel like that's a real tangible way to reduce the amount of work that teams have to do manually. It's just that there's probably, you know, 100 or 120 different use cases where organizations are doing, you know, multi-step processes by hand, be it in Excel or email or notifications or in a ticketing system. And they realize that's not a good use of those very kind of rare and expensive resources. And they're, they're really looking at ways in which they can offload that work to different systems. It also feels like People have more point solutions than ever, and each point solution generates more alerts. And it turns right. out that you know one incident can have 500 different alerts get generated, and we don't really have a way of kind of coalescing all those alerts in this one common thing that I can understand and act on. So what is the problem with our alert systems today, and how do we streamline this whole thing? Well, I mean, I don't know that there's something wrong with the alerting systems. I think it's just the nature of how attacks and data loss and all these things happen is they're multifaceted, right? I mean, you probably see elements of data loss, data exfiltration, account compromise, lateral movement, all of these things, but you see them in your cloud logging, you see them in your SIM, you see them in EDR, you see them, you just see them throughout all of your threat detection apparatus. Um, and, you know, Thank goodness they're working, right? That they're sending alerts, but generally it's associated with one set of activities or you know a single activity. So I think what what organizations are trying to do is figure out how do they correlate that together. They not correlation from a, a sim sense of how do I detect bad behavior, but how do I correlate all these different alerts together into a single case so that I can work them cohesively and you know we don't have a bunch of wasted effort. So what what we're seeing is you know people using things like uh, what we call like alert correlation, uh, intelligence correlation um, that are kind of part of their case management system, but also kind of part of their their daily operating procedures is how do I actually look historically at all the things that have happened in my environment and how much of the, how many of those match? How should they, should they be brought together? Are they associated with each other. And the tricky part in that is that, you know, 
attackers are smart, right? They're they're trying to use deviations. They're trying to manipulate their infrastructure and the, the techniques they use so they can't be correlated. Um, so you have to bring in some things that you probably can't do as a, as a human, right? Things like fuzzy matching and things like that to correlate these things together so that people can, you know, see that they're associated, but work them as a kind of a cohesive set of activities. <laughs> The IT environment itself is also becoming more dynamic. We see things like containers and serverless computing frameworks and multiple clouds. Um, can we keep pace with all that? I mean, we're collecting more data than ever, but I just have to wonder if with all these workloads so highly distributed, you have multiple problems a day that are, that are unrelated to each other. And, you know, are we going to be overwhelmed by that as well? I think teams are overwhelmed. And I, I think that kind of the nature of how we manage infrastructure, uh, the expansion of that infrastructure, you mentioned, you know, we've all been through mobile and virtualization, but now serverless and containers and edge compute and all these other elements are obviously driving a lot more data from a, a logging and infrastructure perspective. There's monitoring tools for each one of these. They're producing uh, things that we have to respond to. So I, I think folks have to find a way to keep up. They don't really have a choice. And, and what this is doing is really changing not not only the amount of information they have to process, but also the way that they have to remediate. You know, historically, we thought about remediation in the sense of I have to disable a user account or isolate a, a workstation or a server, but th those things are physical devices. I can do that on the network. Remediation is much moved much more into kind of the infrastructure change management process that is much more real time from a you know dev DevOps SRE you know GitOps perspective, and moving your remediation thought process has to you know make sure that you have connectivity and and access to those and the permissions to do things but also understand how that's going to affect your infrastructure if you're making automated changes in real time so i think it's both a ingest problem but also a remediation problem that, that folks have to, to find answers for and part of that is how do you reduce the amount of things you have to do by hand uh, but also how do you make sure that you're getting high fidelity information that you're responding to so that's both a, a tuning of threat detection but also a automation of you know detection of bad behavior is too much of our focus on the incident as a, an event to be remediated versus an ounce of prevention and i'm asking the question because for example we see tons of misconfigurations that are out there and that becomes the fundamental original sin as it were that gets exploited by somebody right. else and maybe you know is the definition of an incident need to change when it's the actual configuration is misconfigured that's the incident and we need to get in front of that versus the actual cyber attack that in inevitably ensues. Right. Yeah, no, I, I totally agree. And I, I think you see people trying to make the shift, but I think it, it's also a hard shift, right? The, is the incident the fact that someone exploited a misconfiguration that caused data exfiltration or should the incident have been on the initial mis, misconfiguration? I think it's, it's kind of to the point of the question. And uh, I think yes. And I think folks are thinking about that. And how do I take programs that are, you know, if it's system hardening, vulnerability assessment, data loss prevention, threat hunting, all these programs that, you know, over time maybe have been, you know, hey, I run these quarterly or weekly or at some time interval and move them to continuous activities to be proactive so that when I do see that something is misconfigured, I actually am proactively trying to reduce that kind of risk or that, that threat exposure there in that moment, as opposed to waiting for it to be exploited to take or take response right so i think that desire to move to becoming proactive is is really where people are trying to go um but the 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 boat anchor in that is that it's a lot of work so again you know obviously we have our our bias here at swimlane because we think about automation all day every day but the way that folks get in front of that and, and kind of relieve themselves of all that work that they could never get to um this sits in their backlog or sits on the back burner is to find the things that can be automated, that can be checked continuously, that don't require someone to go out and do that by hand so that you don't end up in just what you said, right? That that bad configuration that actually ultimately becomes exploited. Where does this incident response capability lie within organizations? Because in theory, maybe it's part of a DevOps workflow, but that seems to be focused more on the before things are deployed and maybe more updated, but then there's a whole security function that focuses on things and runtimes and production environments. But where does this incident response responsibility actually lie or should reside? Yeah. 
I, I think it's a general consensus that like security is a team sport, right? You can have a head coach, you can have players that work in particular positions, but it doesn't work if, if it's not working in concert. So, you know, if, if you don't have deep relationships, integrated processes, you know, stand-ups with your, you know, peers in, you know, infrastructure in DevOps in IT and audit compliance, privacy, you name it. Um, it it's really not going to be effective. Like, there's, there's no way you can do the job. Well, um, I don't know if you can win the game to you to continue the analogy, but I think there's, you, you can't, you have to have someone that's quarterbacking it. You have to have someone who's understands it, who is going to make sure that the, the activities are coordinated, that the communication is seamless, but there's no one group or individual that can make make the program successful if you're within an organization of, of any size, uh, because there's just, there's too many, like you said, there's too many things going on uh, and they're living too many different places. So you have to have cohesion across your security and infrastructure and cloud ops and all of these things. If not, um, you're, you're really going to be, you know, you're, you can't move the most important metrics around mean time to respond, mean time to, you know, uh, you know, resolve restoration, all of those things. How do we, embed that muscle memory into an organization. I remember talking to one fellow and I, he asked me some question about some issue. And I said, well, you know, I gave him what I understood to be their resolution. And then I asked him, I said, you know, how come it is you're dealing with this? You know, there's a volumes of literature on this subject everywhere. And he looked at me and he said, son, it's very hard to think about fire prevention when you're holding on to a 10 inch hose for dear life. So the problem is, is that it seems like we are so caught up in the uh, bailing wire and holding everything together that we can't think through what is the right process or best practices for an incident and kind of have that built into our um, collective psyche. Yeah. I think it's both in a kind of a a organizational strategy that has to be put in place, but also like tactical things that have to be done. Right. So I think you you have to make space for preparation, right? If you look at any of the frameworks for incident response or alert management or security in general, there's always the the activity portion, right? So if you're talking NIST, there's, you know, uh, you know, analysis, detection and analysis and response and recovery. But the, the beginning and the end of that is, you know, preparation. Like, how are you prepared for this and how do you get better at it over time? I think as an organization, you have to find time to, to do that. If not, you're always going to be caught in the hamster wheel of, of responding. But the, the other side of that, the tactical thing that you can do there is what what is the thing that your team is spending the most time on today? that is actually not providing a lot of value, that is very, very repetitive, that you don't need to do by hand anymore. And and by tackling that one thing, that low-hanging fruit, you can free up time to do these other more strategic activities of preparation and kind of post-incident activity, uh, like lessons learned and retros and things like that, that I think are really, really important. But you have to, you have to make the time uh, either through, you know, you prioritize prioritizing it, or you have to reduce the amount of daily operational work to give yourself time. And I think you can't probably do it one way or the other. It's probably a combination of both. Mm-hmm. We hear a lot about AI. Do you think AI will save us from ourselves someday? Someday. I, I do think someday, but I, I think the, 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 the problem with security and AI Uh, especially as like an incident responder or as a security operations team is that, you know, AI models work really well. Machine learning models work really well when things are very, very predictable. Um, So they can build very good training sets so they can, they can do these things. And yes, there are things around outlier detection and, and things like that. But the human element of security is always going to be a chess match between, you know, what do we think somebody's going to do? What do they have in place and how do I circumvent that? Um, and those models are, will end up being very, very complex, uh, especially, you know, post threat detection. And I think that there is a future for AI. Obviously we're working on that in, internally really around what, where is machine learning applicable and what we're doing and actually will help our customers uh, and not be just kind of like a marketing buzzword. Um, but I, I do think it has a place in the future, but I do think that people have to be realistic about what can it do for them now um, and how to plan for it down the road. All right, folks, you heard it here first. Whether you're camping in the woods or running an IT shop, there's no substitute for being prepared. Hey, Cody, thanks for being on the show. Thanks, Michael. Really appreciate it. All right. Back to you guys in the studio.
Hi again, everyone. I hope you all enjoyed today's episode of TechStrong TV. We had some fantastic interviews with amazing experts to give you the most recent news in the tech industry. From our coverage at conferences, as well as our episode of DevOps Unbound, we had a lot of amazing content. We'll be back again on Thursday, so we hope to see you then. In the meantime, thank you so much for watching, and I hope you have a wonderful rest of your day. As always, stay strong. Tech Strong.